Welcome to another episode of Pizza Punk. Uh, my name is Jeff. <laughs> my name is Jeff. Pizza Jeff, I guess. Um, and with me uh, today, I have Eric Davidson, uh, Hi, who everyone. is the lead singer of both the New Bomb Turks and the Livids. Mm -hmm. And he's also an author. And um, he wrote this really cool book uh, about, he calls it Gunk Punk. I think of it kind of, I don't know if the, that's like an, that's an interesting it's an, it's an interesting, I guess, it, I guess, what else do you call? Oh, oh yeah. Can I get, Sorry, can go I ahead, get, go ahead. I'll get that one out of the way because I always get asked that. And uh, always, like I'm doing interviews on NBC News all the time. But anyway, um, I, uh, I basically what happened with that was, you know, we knew you do a nonfiction book, you got to have some sort of subtitle. If it was just called We Never Learn and there's like a band on the cover, like what is that, you know? So you got to come up with some kind of subtitle. So we knew we had to right. have that. And I like like silly alliteration and things like that. So it's like gunk punks, kind of rhymes, aha, uh -huh, you know? And I remember I had this list of possible subtitles early on. And then at the end, the editor was like, yeah, we got to pick one, you know? And he liked that one just because he thought, you know, he goes, if we just call it like garage punk in the 90s, then there are still people in this world, if they care to even stop and look at the book when they see that on the spine. Mm. Their garage to a lot of people still kind of means like 60s and paisley shirts and mm. box guitars and stuff. And if you just say punk in the 90s, people tend to think of Green Day and the offspring and all that, you know, and or pop punk kind of stuff. And this book is definitely not about that. Right. And. So he was like, gunk punk's kind of funny, you know, like gunky junk on a garbage can or something, you know, and that totally, you know, kind of fit. And then he said, go through the book and just throw that in here or there just to kind of give a little connective piece. But you don't have to make a big deal about it, you know. I, and I think I say in the very opening of the book, if I remember, I don't sit around and reread my book all that often. But, when, uh, but I think I even said in the beginning, like, I really just... I'm not trying to define bands hate when you do try to define them or put them into a certain banner, you know? So I'm like, but you know, it just kind of connects it together. And even Byron Coley was nice enough to write my forward. And he, he even said in that, that he was like, Hey, if you want to call it gunk punk, whatever, you know? So just to get that out of the way, I wasn't trying to like come up with a new genre, you know, cause we have enough sub genres in punk, you know, but it just was kind of a fun thing to pull the book together a little bit, you know? So what's interesting about that, though, and what my my real question is, uh, and as I was just saying off air, I in probably in the last, I guess in the last ten years, and really it started in the very very beginning for me, with like lamenting. It was a weird time in my life where I was like, "What? There's nothing new. Like everything's like everything sucks, and nothing's <laughs> new." This was about twelve years ago. Yeah. I was just like, "What's out there?" Like, and then I was on YouTube, and I was like. I discovered the mummies like the, yeah. I just had never heard of them, never seen them. Uh, the uh, fight to live on planet of the apes. That's yeah. all. Do you know and about how there's that other band called the, we are the mummies or something like that. Do you know about here? It? Here come the mummies. Here come the mummies. Like, what right. the fuck? like this really makes me mad. This, oh my <laughs> God. This is like, I think this is a great contention with mummies fans too. Cause it's just kind of yeah. like, these guys just totally came in and are aping the mummies gig, you know, like, Here it is. like, do they actually try to say that we didn't know? Huh? Like, do, do they try to make, like, they just made this up and like, I, 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 I never followed down the rabbit hole enough to figure it out. But I, well, what would happen is, you know, and as you know, Eric, I'm sure I can tell you're as much of a music maker and a music writer as you are. You're clearly an, an audiophile with all the records I see in the background that yeah. you are a voracious consumer of music. You, as you know, you, you, discover something and then once you discover something you go down the rabbit hole it's a lot easier in the internet age than it was you know in the analog age you know sure. we have to actually go to shops and like flip through bins of like seven inches and, and vinyl yeah. records and yada 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 yeah. um but yeah that would that's what happens and you know i think that's like the biggest source of controversy really when it comes to any oh my god there's about to be like eight tangents right now ready sure oh yeah the yeah. okay it's the biggest source of source of controversy when a band um, kind of diverges, uh, whether it's because, you know, the front man leaves or the, the founding, a founding member leaves or whatever happens. And then the band continues on as that same thing, but maybe doesn't have the legitimacy, at least from a fan and critical perspective to call themselves that name. Yeah. And all of a sudden you get what essentially is brand confusion and, you know, or you get imitations of what the authentic thing was. And I think that's exactly what happened with here come the mummies is that like, 
you know, you're hunting for like a band that does songs like the fly and, you know, yeah, the yeah. ballad of iron Jack Cody or whatever that song's <laughs> called. And like, and yeah. then like <laughs> you get this, like, I don't know if it's like, I don't mind ska either. I like totally fine with ska, but like, just, it's like a horn section. It's not what you're, it's not that dirty, that right, dirty yeah, raw yeah. garage yeah, rock sound yeah. that you're hoping for. And you're like, your, your ears are almost offended because you're like, I was expecting a cover of what a way to die. I wasn't <laughs> expecting, I wasn't expecting, you know, a bunch of, you know, seven guys wrapped in toilet paper on stage. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's a pretty unmistakable gimmick. I mean, yeah. I think if there's one band in the world doing the wrapped up as mummies, look, you should probably just come up with a different gimmick. You know, it's not like you're like another hair metal band or you're another ska band for that matter, wearing checkerboard pants or something you know it's like yes. it's like you know you're, you're fucking it's literally the same thing you know so whatever yes and um i will say i will give there is one band out there actually from columbus ohio um called mumula I and do not, i do not know of them okay i'm gonna i'll i'll uh i'll send you some information your way they kind they do a mummy themed thing but it's not it's not i it do, i don't it doesn't feel like it's they're ripping off the mummies the way is it like mummy mummies. mixed with dracula is that what that name is I, you know i i think <laughs> i think it might be the mummula cereal remember the the monster oh, cereals yeah, it could yeah, be yeah. mummy that that it could no that's yummy mummy but that was yummy mummy that was yummy mummy and, and no. by the way before yummy mummy there was fruit brute which a lot of yes. people forget about fruit brute but oh, who, I have, and there were conservative the groups. Cons oh, really? Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, I have. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have uh, a whole selection of the. They they did repressings of the cereal boxes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I collect I cereal boxes, there. which is a weird yeah. thing, but I huh. just love cereal box art. And so what I did was I ate the cereal, I kept the boxes, and I stuffed them I like they were. That. <laughs> like they were I, animals. You know? I, I, done I used to keep my Count Chocula's and just break them down flat and sort of put yeah, them away. That's what I did for and then years. One day I yeah. pulled out like three of them one time. I'm like, why? What am I going to do with this? <laughs> what am I going to do with this? So I stopped on that. But they take up uh, a lot of room, but it's like, I love it. Yeah. You know, it's really weird is just today somebody posted, speaking of arcane 70s food, somebody posted that Tab, Pepsi Cola is going to Yeah, it's going out. It's done. I was like, I thought they stopped making tab in like the eight. I didn't even know tab was around anymore. That's what is the, and I don't, what, and what is the, and you know, what's interesting too. Actually, I do know the difference. The difference, it, it essentially, it's made by Coke. Oh, Coke, it's essentially okay. diet Coke. Right. But it's given a feminine, a, right, a, a female, and, yeah, 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 like yeah. The, the pink tax or whatever for, you know, uh, yeah, for, yeah. for diet soda. It can't wasn't just be there, diet oh, Coke, you know, right. Coke wasn't zero, there, you know, yeah. wasn't there some story of, like, didn't the astronauts take tab with them or something like that in the 1970s? Like, that was one of the TV commercials or something. Like, it's really very weird. possible. What a terrible I, thing to be stuck with out in space. But, well, there are some people that, I mean, it's like for some people, Diet Coke is a cult. Like, my brother, he, yeah. all, he, could, he could house, he can house a, you know, doesn't drink a drop of alcohol, but he'll house <laughs> a, a, a 10 pack or a six pack of, of, of DC. Like, it ain't nobody's business. So, right, you know, right. I don't know. And um, to think, but, I thought we were going to talk about pizza, but go back to the mummies or whatever you want. Oh, to I'm actually very here. You know, I'm very, I'm very, uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts on pizza when I ask you the podcast thesis question. So there's a thesis, oh, I, right? Yeah, right. Theme That's right, okay. for the whole thing. Gotcha. Um, but it's really supposed to be like you know we can talk about anything, but it has to be like I, I actually forgot one of these episodes. I forgot to ask my my guest my guest the uh, the question, but I want to go back for a second. So you uh, to gunk punk. Right. And to, to bring it back around, uh, I can see what kind of conversation this is going to be um, to bring it back around um, where. And again, as someone I really I cannot I am not an expert like you. You you actually kind of like I mean, you're you were you're involved in that scene. You came up. Yeah. You, you have a deep, intimate knowledge of this stuff. So yeah. please enlighten me. Um, <laughs> why? So where does budget rock because I know that's like what the mummies, that's like the mummies thing. Yeah. Where does budget rock come into? I'm in that budget rock Facebook group. I've been, that's, and that's where I find out about a lot of the budget rock bands. And on a side note of that real quick, the theme song to this podcast yeah. is a parody version of the sneaky pinks. I'm punk. Wow. That, you have a parody version of a sneaky pink song. I do. I do. Wow. But the thing is, I don't play any instruments. So That's I the had bottom, to... <laughs> that is the bottom of the rabbit hole. If we go any further than that, we can't. We should go up. We should go for like cloud holes or something and not wormholes. Because, because that, you know, instead of we're I'm never so going to get punk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, goes yeah. pizza is so punk. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's I just think it's a great song. And I did yeah. ooey gooey cheese. Do 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 do. It's it's I got a whole thing. But um yeah, I thought you would appreciate that. Um, but what is no no budget rock? So so where where does budget rock fit into all this? Is well, budget I, rock separate from this garage scene? Like how does well, that fit? I would like I would like to think that um you know you you don't want to start sounding like uh like rock jazz rock guys in the 1970s who were you know literally getting angry and you know punching people or hanging up on people over delineations between you know jazz subgenres. Gotcha, gotcha. Um it's all very silly and their words thrown around. I think budget rock wasn't that just from like you know it said it on the cover of a mummy's record or whatever, right? But is that literally how it started? Something like I forget exactly, but and so it's like a joke of like calling stuff like the rip-offs and shit like that, like budget rock because it's cheap, huh. right? It's lo-fi, yeah. It's, and right. they, you know, they recorded a hell shitty, and, com- shitty equipment. Yeah, and I kind of make the point in my book. Basically, there's so many fucking bands. I think I mentioned something like 125 bands or something like that. Mm. In the book. So it kind of diverges a little. It's like the idea is that musically, there's a lot of the same inspirations, which is essentially like being in the early 90s, late 80s, and kind of like being sick of hardcore. And hardcore got kind of macho and silly and sort of, um, and looking be past that to like old raw kind of rock and roll and punk music, it's like rockabilly or the original punk rock stuff or 60s garage rock or whatever, right? And so like musically, all these bands were kind of into that same sort of stuff, you know, looking back to the wild musics of previous decades and kind of, you know, doing these trashy versions of that. And, um, but they kind of diverge. Basically, you could split the bands into like half of them are a little louder and a little faster, like our band, Ubam Turks, and like the Super Suckers and the Devil Dogs and maybe Teen Generates somewhere in the middle there. And then you have the bands, again, similar influences, but go for the whole really super duper lo fi, trashy, black and white seven inch covers, you know, with the cut up right. letters, you yeah. know, Fuzzy. and that's like your rip offs and your, the Gories and, and right. you know, Oblivions and, but especially the mummies and that kind of thing. And they kind of diverge like that, but they're all, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that it was the same scene. No one really became a huge star out of all this stuff. And, and, but all these bands were touring a lot and playing, yeah, but also together. definitely contemporary of, yeah, of oh, each yeah. other. All right? of them, so. we, we all ended up playing the same kind of clubs and playing some right. together. And we played uh, the church played with a ton of the bands in that book. And, and that was the idea I think is that my editor was like, well, look, if someone, he, he asked me to just pitch him a few ideas for a book. Cause I was thinking about writing something. Mm-hmm. And that was one he kind of grabbed on because he thought, well, if anyone's ever going to write a book about these bands and so far, I don't think anybody else has, <laughs> he's like, it may as well be you because you were touring yeah. during that time. You were on Crip records, which is kind of like Crypt with the back from the grave compilations really kind of, you know, that's, that's kind of the main sh- influence on all this shit. You know? Destroy Oh Boy was on that. Yeah. Was on yeah. Record, yeah. And our yeah. second record and blah, blah, blah. But so, yeah, so it's, um, you know, they're just fun delineations. I think Budget Rock stuck around long enough on Facebook and lots of people joined it. So it's fun to go there and see what people are posting. I like when they really do stick to Budget Rock, though. I don't need someone going on there and putting like, hey, this, you know. Yeah, it kind of goes. Song is good. You're like, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Budget to me literally should mean that it was really cheap and you had no money to record that not that you were trying to sound like that exactly but that like, that's how you ended up sounding you know well, well what's interesting two things one so for me not coming up in that scene you know being uh, a child when that scene was going on <laughs> like you know it, it seeing that there's a whole facebook group with the name budget rock <laughs> yeah like and really not knowing anything about it going oh I guess this is a bigger deal than I thought, or I guess that this sort of puts, I don't know, it kind of like put, I don't know, it kind of just put that, it, it created a, I, I don't know, stigma is not the right word. It created a, I don't know, like a, like an expectation of what this sort of thing is and kind of was fascinating, fascinating to me. And, you know, the, what's interesting too, and is that like, I, I guess like the mummies were trying when they're do when they were doing all that stuff and, and using that 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 tag that it was almost like they they're big fans of like the Sonics yeah, right yeah, yeah, and like yeah. uh, and those bands and trying to replicate the like the dr- the way the drums sound yeah, and the way yeah. that they mic'd the drums and did all that sort of jazz yeah. and in order to do that it's like you need to use like Bro- broken shit old yeah, shit. yeah, yeah something yeah. like that I don't yeah. know so yeah, I mean that's how the whole thing kind of came in you know it's just interesting embracing cheap audio rather than you know because that's what happened with a lot of the bands in the book pretty much all of them um most of them aren't rich kids they didn't 
go do their first single in a proper studio because they either didn't have the money or there wasn't a proper studio in their town or whatever. And the, the four track recorder, Tascam, whatever, that kind of started getting cheaper and popular in like the late eighties, middle eighties, I guess. It was easy to get one of those and stick a cassette in there and be able to have four tracks and record a band. And, and I think a lot of bands did it that way. And, and so it's more necessity than anything else, you know, it's like interesting hot take. Maybe it's not a hot take. Interesting observation from what you're saying and thinking about when you when you go to a, when you kind of blow it up and look at the big picture of it all. It's almost and, and, it, and it also kind of plays into, you know, you end your book in the year 2001 and you I've heard you talk about you talk about all the big bands that sort of came or the, the bands that that blew up that came out of that scene, you know, or got bigger, however, however you want to put it, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like uh, uh, whatever the, the white stripes and the, the strokes and yada, 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 one, two, three, X, Y, Z. Um, and in a way it's almost kind of like two things. One, you know, in the way that grunge is like a, it's like a label. It's like a label for a bunch of bands that don't necessarily all sound the same. Yeah. It's kind of like this kind of like works in the same sort of way of like collecting a bunch of bands. Maybe they they vary a little bit here and a vary a oh, little yeah, bit yeah. there. And it's almost kind of like it's almost kind of like a repeat of that cycle, except on a much smaller level. Yeah. Where I you mean, have like I, a couple bands that just sort of like explode in uh, explode open like something that had been going on in a microcosm. Yeah. But it's just on a like, smaller level. It's almost like the the uh to me, it felt like almost like a, I wouldn't say it was a negative, but it felt to me like after Mud Honey and Nirvana got pretty big in the very beginning of the 90s or very end of the 80s, there was a big blow up of ultimately lesser known, you know, or smaller kind of grunge and indie rock bands. This, I think it's just like, you know, basically it was a big scene of bands, rock and roll bands, essentially, who were playing on a lower tier in smaller clubs, but putting out a lot of records, putting out a lot of seven inches, which is how most of these bands got their their sounds out there. And kind of just, you know, since nothing came out of that as really big, like there wasn't a hit, like grunge got Nirvana. And so then your average right. show and your average radio programmer could call it that. And then everybody knew kind of how to place it somewhere. That just never happened in this scene at all. And I write in the book how basically we played this uh, Las Vegas shakedown, this festival in 2000, 2000. and um, really fun. A, a lot of these bands were talking about played it. It was crazy. It was wild. But it also, I was saying going home on the plane on Monday or Sunday, whatever, it felt kind of like the end of something. It felt mm. like a big, huge party, but that you could tell some of these bands are getting a little older. We've been doing this now for 10 years and like, you know, mm. and then suddenly that year um, was when the Strokes started getting some attention and the White Stripes started getting attention and the Hives started getting attention in 2001. And then the Dotsons and the Donnas and all these bands start getting signed, you know, that had like minor hits on MTV. And to me, it looked like, wow, this now you're getting articles in Rolling Stone magazine about Neo Garage and these new crazy lo-fi garage bands. And most of us who'd been doing it for the last 10 years, it was like, now you're noticing this stuff, you know, but we just never, right. it never became a trend the way that punk did or hardcore or grunge or psychedelic rock or rockabilly, because there wasn't one or two big hits that came out in the nineties. You know what? And, I would, you know, like a green day, like pop punk finally got green. Right. Day oh yeah. Austin. True. That's and true. everybody knew like skater shorts and pop right. punk, you know, and that right, never happened. Right. Right. Although I would say, which is great. You, Fine with me. Oh. Right. 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 I mean, yeah, yes, grunge definitely had grunge obviously had the hits, but I would say, though, it really was like it really sort of was um, it's sort of like th that's what happens. It's like there's like a microcosm. It was the same thing. It was the same thing in 77 in a weird kind of way, not on yeah. not, not on an international level. Right, yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's just uh, it's just sort of like a, a interesting how how but how that cycles, how that sort of. Well, but also, comes I about. think. Also, not to be, I'm, I'm not trying to be like pessimistic about this or negative or anything. It's just I don't think of, you're being pessimistic at all. I think no, you're no, I just, your... It's true that basically the way, when I look back on it more and more, and I try to imply it a little bit in the book without saying it blatantly, but yeah. this was kind of like, you know, rock and roll, you, you know, the singer, drummer, bassist, guitar player, yeah. you know, rock and roll the template. Band, yeah. That music was kind of, there was kind of a last stand in a way. And, and you weren't going to have major labels doing you know, bidding wars anymore on rock bands. And that pretty much hasn't happened since about two. Well, I mean, the, the whole system has died too. That right. You're also talking about, 
dude, that's also the time of Napster. Like right. it, it, literally, yeah. Yeah. literally everything uh, started. That was the decline. It was almost like the last, it was the last hurrah for sure. Yeah. The yeah, last so I mean, it's different. It's not going to have it's like, yeah. even when it finally did get the hives who really mm. did come out of the scene, because we used to see the hives when they were young teenagers showing up at shows in Europe and like, what a band, they really, man. Yeah, they're great. And they really did come out of that scene. And same with White Stripes coming out of the Detroit scene and all that. So there were some hits that eventually did happen, but it's just a different time. And yeah. you can't, you just can't expect that, you know, that the Gories were going to get, you know, a $500,000 or deal in 1991 from, they almost did actually not that big but i mean i think a guy who worked at warner brothers was interested in them for a minute but um but you know it wasn't like it just wasn't that world the world we existed in didn't even worry about major label stuff really because you were just you were just trying to go out there and have fun and tour and put out your records you know and and the whole lo-fi thing frees you up to put out whatever the fuck you want to put out you don't have to worry if people think this is going to sound like it was shitty recorded it's like yeah it was shitty recorded you know it's like that's well that's we what's do. interesting it, going back again to like okay so you have rock and roll in the 50s and it's this it's this brand new invention and it's you know whatever three three chords right, right. i'm not right. A, again not a musician please feel free to correct me on any thing that i say i'm a um, singer don't ask me you know okay well you're more of a musician <laughs> than i am but um uh the um you have you have rock and roll in the 50s which is whatever three chord yada 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 and that obviously that gets exaggerated and blown up even though you have the branch of garage that's sort of running concurrently everything else is like exploding you know and you know you get beatles and then and stones yeah, and then yeah, yeah, you know whatever blah 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 blah, blah, blah prog rock blah blah, blah 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 um and then you get the return you get the return to form with punk yeah right you get the return to form really when something like you know i get you know at least a separate from garage is a weird thing because garage is happening this whole time on the side with like the seeds and like the sonics yeah, and all, yeah, and yeah, all yeah, those yeah, bands yeah. i guess but you get you get iggy in going i wanted to bring the blues to the teenagers or something i think that's the quote that's something, like that. said, yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that and that's the, essentially the birth of of this second wave of you know this return to the original that original aesthetic and then what's interesting is that all these bands in the 70s all these kids in the 70s who are like i'm never going to be you know this guitar player that guitar player but like oh here's i i can just get a guitar and do three chords and be like the new york dolls yada 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 or the ramones yada 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 and then what's interesting in a way but those bands still needed to record in studio yeah and then and then comes the 80s and 90s or whatever and you're talking about the task cam four track recorder and then well, suddenly I say, I say this in my book too that i think a lot of bands like growing up in the 80s in cleveland i knew bands who were on indie labels, flirted with some major labels. And they already knew like the whole DIY thing was kicking in partially because of hardcore. I mean, hardcore obviously had a big deal to do with that. And you just take over your own career and you don't sit right. around wor worrying if an A&R guy is going to pop into your town and sign you. You just go because, yeah, if you look back to that original, you know, the original punk explosion or whatever, Ramones, Patti Smith, Richard Hell, Television, they were all talking heads. They were all recorded very well in pretty good, nice studios, and they were expected to be the next big bands. But then they weren't the next big bands. I mean, they sold a little bit. They certainly sold more than any band in my book. But they well, were- Well, they tried to the repackage it too as New right, Wave. Right. Yeah, and they weren't, you know, they didn't sell big in the top 10. And so after that, I mean, I personally think after the Velvet Underground- rock interesting fun or future looking rock and roll became just noisier and weirder or faster mm. or the lyrics became a little a little weirder or more violent or whatever and ever since the velvets i mean it, most rock and roll was gonna either get popular and very well recorded and playing in stadiums or be poppy or it was going to be not unlike jazz it was going to get weirder and weirder and less commercial so by the time bands like us in the late 80s and early 90s rolled around there was you didn't even think about like oh we're going to get recorded well or we're going to be on a label you, know, you just kind of figured out how to put your records out somehow and it was usually local right. friends who had seven hundred dollars to put out five hundred seven inches you know yeah but that's what I mean that's that was the in the way that in the way that three chords in the seventies democratized rock and roll again yeah you know in that kind of way those those machines democratized like you know putting oh, stuff out yeah. DIY yeah recording for and 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 it's just interesting because you know you hear always about the 70s or the the, the uh, late 70s early 80s 
And then the next thing you hear about is pop punk in the nineties or whatever, but you don't really hear about, and that's why I think your book and the fact that you kind of cover this area. I mean, like, it, it's just interesting how it, um, that, that I feel like that doesn't get talked up. No, yeah. Thanks. Enough, you know, so. thanks. I mean, that was the main thing that was actually probably the first thing I brought up with the mm. editor. I was like, I'm tired of being a fan of all this stuff. And right. you basically see by, by, by the ladies, you already had a lot of rock and roll documentaries already. And you even had punk rock mm. documentaries by then. I remember, was it PBS actually did a like six night, six night documentary series on the history of rock and roll in like 1987 or 88. And I remember the punk episode was really great because it started with a clip of the modern lovers, which I thought was really cool. I'm like, right. Cause they're like, the, are, yeah, they're covering more than just, I mean, I love the Ramones, but they're covering more than just the Ramones and then, you know, Patty Smith and whatever. And that was cool. But even in that documentary series, it's just like you said, it hopped from basically early hardcore. And I mean, early, like 80, 81 and black flag, and minor threat, maybe. And it usually hops ahead to like Nirvana got huge and, Punk finally sold records, you know, like that's always how they slap, they slap grunge and Nirvana, but that's what they do. They, that it's, you know, it's almost like it's, it's, it's not fair. They take grunge and Nirvana and they go, they're trying to figure out, well, what's the missing link in this, in this era of alternative music? Oh, it's grunge. Smack that on like that, like that meme you always see where they, the guy smacks the tape on the, on the water, like completely underwriting all these bands that you're talking about, you know, basically a decade of yeah. like not, not talking about the post-hardcore kind of bands and then like early alternative rock bands or whatever, you know, like um, whoever, I don't know, whatever, Dinosaur Jr., Sonic Youth, and those kind of bands are kind of, but, but whatever, that's a whole other thing. But yeah, my so my book, I knew like, I'm like, well, if they're jumping ahead 10 years to Nirvana and meanwhile talking about just, you know, once you, once you get past Nirvana, I mean, most grunge is just terrible. I mean, nobody cares about, most of those bands are around, who cares about like, I don't know, you know, candle box or whatever. They yeah, but what about the label? But also the label of grunge yeah. is much like new wave in a way. It's just sort of like, it's, yeah, it's trying to take a bunch of, yeah, it's a blanket. It's sort of like a blanket thing in the same yeah. way that, in the same way, frankly, that, you know, as my use of, of budget rock or whatever, is that it's not, that it's really like this tiny little thing that's being used to like encapsulate. I think, from I, think budget more, rock, you know? I think the budget rock Facebook should have a rule that none of, any band mentioned is not allowed to have any album covers with color photos involved at all. It has to be Ooh. black and white. <laughs> and that's it. If there's a color photo involved, no longer are you budget rock. And um, and that's about it. No, but um, no. So I was just saying that I think after that, you know, grunge just got so huge and everything. And there were really were a whole strata of bands. And some of them, like you're saying, it's a wide, you know, I have the muffs and rocket from mm. the crypt in my book, you know, and blues explosion mm. and, and those bands were like not exactly like the mummies or the ripoffs or Tina Jenner or something, you know. But right. they they all kind of toured around the same clubs and to, went to the same European festivals and things like that. And that's how you survived in that era. But we were never going to get mentioned in like big articles in Spin Magazine or something because it's just a whole other world. But there was so much of it, just so many records. And I just looked around and I'm like, there are so many of these bands, and a lot of them were still playing. I started writing my book in 2008. A lot of these bands were still around, Candy Snatchers, and mm. a lot of them were starting to reform. Teen Generate was starting to do some reunion shows, and you know the Muffs were still around, and the Gorys started playing again, and like you know uh, Greg Cartwright from the Oblivions, he never yeah, really Oblivions are always the kind of in and out, right? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, a lot of these bands were still around, and I'm like, man, it's just a shame that like if you could just combine them and kind of show people that something was going on, and I don't even want to say necessarily that it was some sort of real genre trend but in in a way it was it just never had that big hit that named it you know there was never an article you know in the new york times where they called it you know slop rock or something you know and right, everyone started right. saying slop rock you know, it's like, you know. It never got the mainstream attention that grunge and then again uh, completely slapping over what we're talking about is you know green day pop punk offspring you know that yeah. sort of that sort of situation and then here's the other thing that's going on at the same oh, and time a really and quick one i wanted to say was just go ahead go ahead go you ahead. get what you, you get what you you work for and again one more time yeah. every, every one of these bands pretty much did not worry about finding the right producer or getting the right you know, they just wanted to play and have fun and chances are in our society unless you have that kind of ambition to be like let's go pay a hundred thousand bucks to the biggest producer. You're not going to have hits. And if you don't have hits, no one's going to hear of your genre, whatever the fuck it is. And it just wasn't right. part of the world. We just played to have fun. But go ahead. Sorry. Um, and then 
and then something interesting happens and this is kind of where i guess so okay so uh in not not inserting myself into the story but just sort of like my pov as a teenager going up and being exposed to punk rock and being exposed to um bands that were outside like you know i, I knew who the sex pistols were mm -hmm. i knew who you know i knew who the clash were but uh you know um I, i'll never forget picking up for five dollars and 99 cents um getting punkorama 2. oh yeah and those eps and to you guys i feel like maybe a lot of these bands are kind of like roll their eyes or like just like whatever about these eps but you have to under or these uh collect compilations whatever yeah, yeah. but to me and kids my age th th this was like our nuggets no i in hear a that kind of way you I know hear, like i hear that all the time and do you I really yeah and and then <laughs> one of the one of the main songs always we get this where someone will come up and go do jukebox lean do jukebox lean. yeah 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 <laughs> Because that song was on the, the first Punkarama we were on, I believe. No, yeah. that was that was Punkarama. You were, on, yeah, yeah. Punkarama well, two was jukebox we name. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and then you did defiled on Punk on Punkarama three. Snap decision on Punkarama four. Wow. Automatic out teller on Punkarama five. Wow, I'm glad. And you I don't remember. think you were on. I think you guys left. Yeah, 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 yeah. By we that were, time, that was the last one. Yeah, we had a three record deal with them, and when it was over, we it was it was done, and that was that. We, you know, we moved on. But but those those comps, I mean, definitely, like, yeah, of course, like, you know, when we signed with Epitaph, we were excited because like the Cramps were still on Epitaph, and like we loved uh, Gas Huffer and the Humpers and all these kind of more garage. Oh, love the Humpers. Yeah, yeah, the Red Ants and, and Red Ants, Z, Z, great band. And these are bands that we liked. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like, all right, let's give it a shot. Even though, you know, honestly, quite honestly, like I didn't like 95% of the roster on Epitaph. It wasn't my idea of punk, but they were nice people. They did what they said they were going to do. Um, they really wanted to try to shoehorn in some of these other garage bands that they had. And, you know, yeah, kinda... TSOL was on. TSOL yeah. was on that comp too. Well, no, yeah, was I mean, like, yeah, yeah. So you know. when, those, when those comps came out, yeah, I really learned really quick when like we would tour that like, damn, these CD comps, like, people really find them and, and the Huge. label gave them away a lot Huge. too, you know, so it helped. I mean, it definitely yeah. helped. And, and, you know, to this day, yeah, every tour, somebody says, Oh, I had that punk Rama and I want to hear jukebox lean. And it's like, frankly, we stopped playing that song and probably like, and you also stop playing or you don't play snap decision, which is truly, no, we do not, you do not. And I got to tell you, I, I, I saw, so I saw you guys at the bell house in 2014. Oh yeah. That was a fun show. That was a phenomenal show. <laughs> and I kept waiting for, you know, again, the, those I have. OK, so I have scared straight. I ha I think I have at rope's end. But, you know, and, you know, I wouldn't call I'm, I'm definitely don't know your guys's deep cuts. I don't. Mm -hmm. But like yeah. I, you know, I, I definitely enjoy a, a wide. But and you know, what's interesting too. T tell me if I'm wrong. Go ahead. Tell me I'm wrong. But I really get I get like this. Like what? Wh where do the Rolling Stones fit in your guys? Oh, DNA? like one of our favorite bands, of course. You know, I love the okay. Stones. Oh, right, right. Okay, I'm yeah. glad I'm not like off about that because I got to tell yeah. you, you know, for every every once in a while, I'm like, listen, when I'm listening to you guys, I always think of the Stones. I always feel like that sort of like, I always feel that um, vibe from you guys. And the other thing that's interesting too, on you know when you do have like um, keys, you know, and it's always like. The keys are ferocious, and I'm always thinking of Scotty Thurston from <laughs> later era Stooges. Is that like, am, am I am I on the mark with any no, of that completely. stuff at all? Yeah, completely. Yeah. Of course, we love the Stooges when they use the piano playing, and and right. we like the Saints a lot, the Australian band that used horns really well. Saints are great. Yeah, you know. So I mean, it's like, yeah, of course. And I think that, again, that's what a lot of these bands that we would bump into and we would meet, like the Devil Dogs or Team Generate or uh, the Gorys guys or whoever. Mm -hmm. um, when we would meet all these bands, they were all like that. They were all like, yeah, what's wrong? Because, you know, the hardcore era, by the end of the 80s, if you were at a hardcore show, you didn't sit around talking about, you know, who played, you know, horns on a fucking Alice Cooper record or something. You know, like, you know it was very like you liked punk and you liked hardcore. And that right. was it. You know, and if you talk about something else, you were a fucking fan or whatever, you know. Right, 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 right. And, right. And the machismo. Like, the machismo. Yeah, right. Yeah. And we're like, why? You know, like, and so all the bands we ran into were really... They liked, I mean, if they liked a little Richard song that had pianos and they liked, 
you know, a ghetto boys song that had a sample of a piano, you know, whatever, you know. So yeah, the I Stones were them. definitely, yeah. Stones were always a favorite since I was, they were what I considered when I was a little kid. They were the first band I thought of was my, like, I really liked them. Not because my brother liked them and I learned from him or my sister had the record and I got it from her, but because I sort of found it and really liked it. And I always loved this. And we all love the Stones. And yeah, especially you, on Abro, it's Abro. in It's in the DNA. It's not, and here's the thing. When I say Stones, that I don't think for a split second, I don't think that you think that I think this for a split second that like, you know, that the music is emulating the stones. It's just in the DNA. It's like the spirit. Oh, it feels we, like uh, the spirit, the spirit animal. We emulated you know? it. You said you, you thought you had app ropes and go back to app ropes and again. And we, we definitely, I took a riff, you know, every album, there was maybe one song that I came up with part of a riff. I wasn't, not oh, much really? part, but there might be one song in every record that I like have a riff on a chorus or something, but there's a song on that record that I basically lifted a bootleg stone song that never got on one of their records and just sort of like turned it around. And we ended up using that for a song. So, I mean, you know, it, it yeah, they were, they're a definite favorite, like all the way through, you know, what so. question, question, what is the difference between uh, take me through how defile under defiled is different from defiled. Why are what what is that version of that song? And you claim you don't know the deep cuts. So uh file under I, I really I'm I'm I really don't like I I I kind of like I again I just don't want to like come off seeming like I, I really know my shit. I don't, but I'm oh, curious. That's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. Fine. Um when uh so a friend of ours was running a label um when he was working at Touch and Go and he started his own label and he asked if we wanted to do this EP. So we had some songs from the at ropes end session. Oh, okay. That, so that was the original version. That no, the one that's was, on. We just decided to do another one. I think we even recorded gotcha. them probably the same day. I, I don't know. So we did one where we just jammed forever in the middle. We kind of wanted yeah. it to be sort of like a Sonic Youthy thing where you the chords all break down and you're down to nothing but sort of making some noise and rumbling drums and then you kick it in, right? So we wanted to do something like that. So we did the really long one. And then I think it's your a, shout. It's your shout. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. So we 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 you know? did that one and then we did the one that made it on the record. We're not going to put a fucking whatever 8 minute song on the record or whatever. But we could put it on that first side of that 12 yeah. GP. We thought that would be kind of cool. And we were trying like to do version. a little bit of a piss take on the whole like when bands put out like the 12 inch GP with the extended version or whatever. You know, it was kind <laughs> of a little bit of a piss on that. But um yeah, no, I like the version. It's cool. It's really it was fun to do to just throw shit in there and there's there's like some uh, synthesizers and shit thrown down in there and shit, just noise. Yes, right? yes, so, which you don't have on the other version, which is, you know, again, I love that version. I love the one that's on at Rope's End and on the comp and whatever, but that version was is a very interesting version where it's like, I mean, see, here's the thing. I, I love that shit. I love it when you find that alternate version <laughs> of whatever, and it's like, and it's a, a, a variation. It's different in some way, shape, or form, and sort of restructures the song for you in a completely different way. And that's why I, I just wanted to know what the genesis was of that particular yeah, version. Yeah, I mean, we song. definitely are not very much into doing eight minute songs or something. I forget how long it is. It might be eleven for all. I don't know what the hell it is, but it's, um, I think it's like seven minutes. Seven minutes or something. Yeah. I think, but I, think. I mean, to us, that may as well be a suite on the side of an Emerson Lake and Palmer <laughs> record or something. You know, it's like it's your stairway but, to um, heaven. Yeah, 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 right. But um, but it was fun to try and it was fun to mix and everything. When you mix something that long, it's just bizarre, you know. But but yeah, yeah but when you do that live, when you yeah. did that live at the bell house, you had everybody getting down, you had us all getting down low, and yeah. you're like, you're like, yeah. you're like, get down low, get down yeah. low. And that's what made me think of shout because, like, yeah. you know, it's like a little bit softer now, yeah, a yeah, little yeah. Bit softer, and then a little bit louder now, and then you do yeah. the 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 how the, the shriek, the howl, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much um. It. So I don't know. Also, it's fun to see if people will actually do it. Listen you know? to you. Just fucking come on. Just yeah. Just, just get down, please. I always, I always, try, I always catch a guy's face in the audience who's just like, oh, "No way, man." It's just like a like, dude. It's party. Just yeah. Just just go ahead and get down. And I'm gonna keep doing this until you do. <laughs> so and the girlfriend's usually doing this to him and laughing and telling him to get down. It's very funny. Now, when you're on the stage, and and this is what I noticed. This is the only time I saw you guys um, live, and um. I mean, you def there's definitely you got a little you're doing a little Jagger, doing a whole lot of Iggy, you know, it's like but, you know, it genuinely seems like you become possessed by the music and you um, it's like a you, uh, it's like a Jekyll and Hyde thing. Like all of a sudden, like you, you're transformed by the madness of what you're hearing 
and you just the way you like just sort of like you know ape with the audience and you know you 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 can you, you know uh just sort of like mess around with people like in in a playful wonderful joyful way that right. sort of thing uh and it's just really fun like what happens to you when you're on the stage you is that is that true do you feel the music like that or well, what's going I on i always i always joke that i feel like i have a sixth sense for not fuck for for not fucking with the wrong guy you know that's happened to me three or four times in all these years where like that night i made the mistake and messed up that guy's hair or whatever and he got pissed yeah and tried, tried to punch me or whatever most people get it like two songs in that like yeah i'm not i'm not trying to be some serious poet shaman up there or and i'm right. also not like trying to be a violent really like fucking punching people you know playful. It's, it's you're fun, playful you know? it's playful it's like jumping yeah. around but yeah, I mean, you know, like you said, I mean, it sounds weird when you say it yourself, but like, yeah, I, I don't know, possessed, but I mean, you definitely get like, all right, possess, let's, let's retract that from the record. Not no, the word possessed, but that's like, right. it's just interesting how you, cause you seem like, no, you just seem like a, cons, uh, a very uh, reserved person. And then when the show started and, you know, that was my first time seeing any of you guys and just being like, you know, I'd heard the, the Turks on, so, you know, so much, you know, whatever, listening to, you know, Veronica Lake, Jews from a clown, whatever, yada, yada, yada. And and then all of a sudden, like seeing you guys live for this first time, and it was well, just very. Well, I, remember, I don't know. It was just... uh, Rick Sims, the singer of the Digits, who are also in my book, and they're a great band, and you should. Yeah, he was there. He was uh, on the stage, right, for oh, Defiled. Was that, that show, or, um, I don't remember. Would no, you... maybe not. Maybe not. There was some guy on stage. No, no. Yeah, who's the guy on stage with you? I don't even remember. It might have been my. Oh. And I don't, I don't know, but that was a while ago. But um, the Rick Sims from the Digits. One time we were playing with um, uh with them and uh or no it was the gaza strippers his second band called the gaza strippers and we were playing with them we were having gaza strippers. yeah 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 and we were we were having dinner before the show what a name yeah. and rick like if you think i i don't think i'm necessarily a, a calm subtle guy before shows but rick really is he's, he's kind of a quiet thoughtful yeah. guy and then he gets on stage and he's nuts and so we were sitting having dinner and this kind of fan came over and she said man you're so you're so nice and sort of calm and you're so crazy on stage i wouldn't expect you to be like this he's like what do you think i'm gonna like during dinner, I'm going to jump around and throw things and take my pants down and stuff, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of like, people are always so surprised. But then it's like, <laughs> like you're going to walk into a room, <laughs> jump on a table. You know, yeah. yeah. I'm not like constantly, you know, I'm not like constantly screaming in people's faces. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, going yeah. to the DMV. Can I get the picture taken? You know? But um, so I, I, I just, you know, you, you get up there and yeah, I mean, it really is. There are times when you're on tour and it's like the third weekend and my voice is gone and you're kind of tired. And like, maybe I twisted my ankle the night before, or like there was a, you know, the band got a little scuffle in the, in the van or something, or, you know, whatever bad things can happen on the road. And you're kind of in a bummer mood or something. It just, it's totally sounds like Bruce Springsteen, you know, but it's so true. It's like you get on stage and no matter what pissy mood, I remember walking on stage just thinking, you know what, tonight, I'm just going to lean against that bass amp and I'm not going to do shit. I'm just going to sing and lean against the bass amp, you know. And, um, but, you know, after about a song of it, it, I, again, sounds like a Springsteen thing to say, but I see people in the audience like I was that guy, you know, when I was 17 and I went to see a show. If, if Iggy was going to be a dick that night and not do anything and just lean on an amp, I probably would have been kind of pissed off, you know. And so, you know, you, you just kind of, you get into songs, which I like our songs. I really appreciate the chance to play with my friends who I think are really awesome. And they, and I was fortunate enough that we all kind of mesh together musically. So it feels good to play with them and hear them getting into it. And then you just kind of go, you know, and, and there are some nights, I mean, you are on tour, there are nights where you're like, okay, we're getting paid for this night. We got to get through this show, you know, and you just kind of try to get through it. But I can honestly say from the bottom of my heart, that happens maybe once a tour. You know, I always have fun during the show and I have fun after the show. Um, the drives are kind of boring, but other than that, you know, so once I get up there and you get a couple songs in, it's like, you can't help but just kind of get into it. And unless, like, even if the crowd really sucks, inevitably, and there's 20 people there or something, inevitably there's a couple people that are hilarious and fun and they go right up front and throw a glass of water at some or something, you know, and then you get into it, you know, so. Well, what's interesting is, I, you know, I did, I, I had, I, I toured with a band once. We, we did a European tour. We did a North American tour. I, I'm not a musician, but I, I do video stuff. And um, the thing, the, my biggest takeaway uh, from my tour experience was that one of the biggest takeaways was that, you know, um, 30 seconds in you, you, first of all, you don't know what's going on with someone, whatever that particular day is. Yeah. You know what I mean? As what you just said, like you're doing the exact same thing over and over and over again, every single night. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, the people come to see you guys play or see a band play and they get their, the 30 seconds that they're going to remember, you know, uh, time and again in memoriam is 30 seconds out of, you know, 24 hours out of, you know, the six weeks of touring, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't, they, they don't line up for each person when, when there's necessary interaction. And, and it's just interesting how you don't know what's going on in someone's mind. You don't know how yeah. they're like, what, what, uh, uh, and, and therefore that could, yeah, that does kind of affect, you know, what may or may not go into, you know, uh, a show and not realizing well, that. Another thing we tried to do was, um, a lot of songs, yeah, we like a lot of songs. We're going to play them every night because we know either we like them or people maybe want to hear them or whatever. But we did try to mix up the track, the, the song list yeah. every, every night, you know, at least a little bit. Even even the later years when we've been doing these reunion shows and stuff and you tend to fall back on the songs you really know and maybe you haven't, if you haven't played something in 15 years. You, you guys got a lot of songs, though. Yeah, man. we have a lot of songs. You have over 100 songs. You have like 100 songs. I'm sure more than that, yeah. But, um, but we, you know, we we tried to mix it up that way because that can make it interesting too because even if you yeah. flub up one of them and you fuck it up and go we're definitely not doing that tomorrow it can be kind of funny in a way it can be yeah. oh, like fuck, let's just get on to the next song so it always there's different things you can do that that always you know keep it fresh and these kind of things that we do now you know ever since we officially broke up at uh, the very end of 2002 when I we started the right way that's the yeah. greatest what, what you guys did is great like I mean, the way you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna stop and the way that you guys stop and then all of a sudden it's like it's not like you stop though you, you every once in a while you whatever you get an offer to go here or there or whatever and you pick up and you put you know you do a warm-up show in new york you go across the sea to you know do do this festival or that festival or whatever that's pretty cool yeah it's yeah, pretty, pretty hard cool. to say no when some spanish festival wants to bring you over yeah you know and we're all still friends we get along and and you know it's not too hard to get to get it well sometimes it's you know there's a lot of machinations that have to go on people's jobs and everything else but we right. can you know, we try to pull it off and it keeps it fresh. And I mean, you know, it's just, I, I, sometimes I wonder, you know, I'm getting older. I'm not a spring chicken, as they say. So sometimes you're like, man, are we going to be able to pull this off? And the shows we did last fall and in the, before all the COVID shit um, were really fun. I thought we, yeah, you really guys played Brooklyn and I totally missed that. And I was yeah. like, Oh, my last show was the Pixies in, at, at Brooklyn's Brooklyn steel. Oh yeah. They played that. I forgot about that. Yeah, they, and not. you know what? I had just seen them and I, was like, ah, do I really need to go again? And I was like, uh, you know what? Definitely need to go again. And because they played the brand, they played the whole album, the, the, uh, every song off the new album, which well, did, for me was that was one of the first like live reviews I ever wrote for the scene magazine in Cleveland. I saw the Doolittle tour at a bar. And, wow. And they, were, and, and they were really great. But it's funny you mentioned the 30 second thing that you remember because Happy, oh. Happy Mondays opened up, and I'm not exactly a Happy Mondays fan. But, yeah live they were kind of hilarious because they had this guy i forget his name but he toured and played with them and everything but he all he did was just dance on stage really fucking goofy and he's super goofy and it would it was just pissing some people off so bad i just thought that was so funny i always kept that in my head i'm like i'm just amazed how people can get pissed off at like someone's being super goofy i thought that was sort of like kind of amazing you know so i, I kind of kept that in my head over the years you know be like that fucking stupid dancer for him yeah yeah wow you lucky <laughs> duck yeah, you saw man. Oh, that was like when they were like, that's when they were the bee's knees, man. That that's yeah. why I mean I love that album, but I love I mean it was I, I'm glad I'm glad I went because I don't know the next time when any of us yeah, yeah, did a I know. show, man. Oh well when we did these shows, I was really happy because like we, we played some towns we either had never played before or haven't played in like years. And we played nice. Atlanta in whatever that was, January, February. We played Atlanta and wait. Oh, you played in 2022? Yeah, we played oh. We played a Cleveland Pittsburgh weekend and we played four shows down south with Nine Pound Hammer, our old uh, Crip Records huh. label mates. And that was a lot of fun. And we did At Atlanta and we haven't played Atlanta since like 2001 or something. Yeah, but see, how and great is that that you great. can even it do that? Honestly, one of it was honestly, I can honestly say it was one of the best shows we played since back when, you know, we were playing consistently. It was really fun. Was really fun. You know, what's interesting though. And it's just like, you know, so I, when there's no, when there's no drama or when there's no like serious turmoil and a band has to call it quits, it's like, why not just do what you guys do? It's like, you're like, Oh yeah, we'll get together. We'll do, you know, four shows here. We're going to do a weekend here. Have a great time. It's like all the best parts without all the, the dreg of like, you know, doing 30 dates and like all the drives and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, it's like, I mean, not that's, only not only couldn't we probably do that because of everybody's various jobs and children and everything else, 
um, physically, you know, as you get older, you want, yeah. especially for our kind of music, you want to make sure that you can put on a, a you know, a good enough energy every night. And also sometimes I know some people say like, they're like, well, you know, you guys haven't put anything new out in years and what the hell. And it's like, yeah, but we're not, we're not doing like, like you said, two months and we're asking people to pay $150 to see us in an arena. You know, it's like, to me, right. that's a little weird when bands haven't put out a record in 30 years and then they ask everybody to pay 300 bucks to go see them. It's like, to me, that's like, well, that's just kind of weird. But these are fun. Most people, you can sneak in our shows if you want. You know, <laughs> it's just like, you know, we, we just, we're playing, you know, I mean, it ain't five bucks to get in, but I mean, we're, I think we're just trying to have fun to older fans hopefully we try to catch some newer fans and and i think we get a good good amount of younger people coming to our shows and it kind of i always wanted to prove that like a lot of the bands we were compared to when we first started out were like dead boys you know um the saints you know also like, columbus ohio yeah and when we started out being compared to those bands i always wanted to be like what people would say about bands like that is, oh, you, that's youth music. You can't, you only do that for a couple of years and you burn out, you know? And I always wanted to kind of prove that you could keep up that kind of energy for a while. And I guess at this point, fuck, I, I guess. Embarrassing I story time. I, I'm embarrassed to say that I did this and, and I regret what you want to know something, you know, you say, oh, no regrets or, you know, uh, no regrets in my life. Yada, yada. I do. I have some regrets. And you know what one of my biggest regrets is? One of my biggest here. regrets. I've seen a lot of bands that like, you know, there's some bands that have gone under my nose. And I miss like, for instance, when J Jay Retard was coming to New York all the time, when I was in the city all the time, I just, I was just, just not on my radar. And I became a huge, huge fan of that blood visions album and the, not as much the follow up. And I'm just like thinking about all the times that I could have seen that guy yeah. when he came through New York and I just missed it. And, um, I, you know, and then there are other times where it's like, Oh, I, I did, you know, I did get to see the stooges twice with, Ron Ashton and Scott Ashton. And I was literally, I got on stage and I jumped on Iggy and I was this close and I saw, you know, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but, but here's the, there are other times where like, for instance, that the CBGB gallery, you remember the gallery oh, next yeah. to, oh, yeah. yeah. The yeah. gallery was like, that was becoming like, that was like the, the, uh, the B spot. Like if, if CBGB's proper was a, yeah. Yeah. then CB gallery was like the B spot. And so the, the remaining dead boys, did two reunion shows in 2005 oh, wow. and it was oh, everybody. I that, yeah. yeah. It was everybody, but stiff and the stimulators were playing the room, you know, uh, the stimulators yeah. were playing. And I think adrenaline OD was playing wow. and I went down there and my, all my friends were going to see Ted Leo. I like Ted Leo. Got no problem with Ted Leo. Uh, he was uh, playing the South. Mean, you know, whatever. Of, you're playing out in New York a lot at that time. I mean, you yeah, he was, Oh, he was constantly Ted Leo was there a lot. And my friend, I had seen him before and uh all my friends were going to see ted leo no one gave a shit about seeing the dead boys and i was like i got to see yeah them, you dead gotta boys. you always pick one of those reunions over a younger band because you, you're never gonna and even if it ends up sucking and they you, you know you're never gonna see these guys probably do it again you know well the thing is is like i wasn't around to see them right. initially and actually you mentioned the regrets on that is one of my yeah. few, few regrets is and it's funny being in a band now that does these reunions nearly every yeah. year Back when the Pistols did their 20th anniversary in 97. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The United States, I remember being that, well, I was already, what, 30. But I uh, I yeah. was I was one of those people who was like, oh, whatever. No, it, fucking, it was like $50 or some outrageous fucking sum. And I and it was up in Cleveland, so I would have had to travel. And I wasn't sure I was going to get there yeah. in the car or anything. And I was like, ah, they're going to be fucking fat old guys. So who cares? And ever since, and I had friends who went, and I've talked to people, and and they just all say they were great. And I wish they looked great on YouTube, those shows. Yeah. And because even if it was, even if it was bad, now that I've gotten older, it's like, well, you have the experience. You can say, Hey, I saw it. And a few years ago, um, my girlfriend, uh, got me into a stone show and, um, nice. yes, it was very nice. She got that for me. And we went to see the stones and similar thing. That was one of the first shows I could have ever seen in my life, but my mom wouldn't let me go because she thought I was too young. All these years went by, never really had an actual chance to see them. Certainly not one that I could afford, but just wherever I live, they didn't come or whatever, right? Well, they're coming through, and this was 2013. And she got me tickets, and we were both like, well, who, who knows? But at least we can say we saw the Stones, right? And it was great. They were fucking awesome. They were really, really great. So you just never know, you know? I saw, uh, I saw the, the year, I think it was 2010, the best shows I saw that year were Mummy's Reunion, Zero Boy's Reunion, and- Dude. 
it would you know it was like oh and the and DMZ original lineup of DMZ played. Wait, and, I want to talk about the mummies for a and, second. You, know, so you never know; those reunion shows can be really good. Before, yes, they can really they can suck. Yeah. I didn't end up seeing the Dead Boys because what happened was, I got I get down to the show. Oh, sorry, I, just, I didn't mean to interrupt that whole. Oh show. no, no, no! It's dude, totally fine, totally fine. Um, I get down to the show. I, I this is I just read Please Kill Me for the first time, mm -hmm. you know, and I. I saw I saw Jimmy Zero was standing right there smoking a cigarette right in front. There are all these kids. Nobody recognizes that Jimmy Zero is standing there. I walk right up to Jimmy Zero and I say, hey, 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 Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. And he turns and he's like, who's this guy that even recognizes me? Like, because it's yeah. like, who who knows what Jimmy Zero looks like? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, now, honestly, today, like, yeah. Especially now. And I just and I go and I go, I go, is it true that Stiv used to jerk off in the chili at uh, at CBGB's? And he just like, he like looks at me, he like smiles and just starts talking to me, brings me backstage oh, awesome. the Stevie GB gallery and all the dead boys are there and oh, I was hanging awesome. out with them. And then I, for whatever, I don't remember why, I, I guess I just wanted to hang out with my friends. I left. I didn't yeah. go to the show oh. and I totally regret it. I totally, oh, Eric, should, I'm embarrassed. Eric, yeah. I'm, I'm embarrassed I, and I'm humiliated and I'm, so I'm admitting it I now. I don't really want to do this interview anymore. No, I, 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 no, but it was just like, I, I look back on that and I said, in, the, in my mind at that time, it was more important to hang out with my friends. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's Than it was to see, but they never did it again. Yeah. They never, they never, the four of them never got back together. And, you know, is it going to be the same? Obviously, it's never going to be the same because it's no stiv. But well, like, I saw them, I think, that same year. They did a tribute to so what Stiv died in what was it 91, I think? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. they did a tribute in Cleveland where they got the original lineup together and they put at the Beachland Ballroom, which is kind of a smaller right. version. Yeah, 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 yeah. They did two reunions. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a smaller version of Bowery Ballroom, like like that, mm -hmm. but smaller, like an old Ukrainian dance hall kind of thing. And they yeah. they played and they put a mic stand in the middle and had, I guess Cheetah still had Stiv's old leather jacket or whatever, and they hung it on the mic stand. And they played. Oh, that's sweet. And, you know, for for me, obviously, as being a singer, it's like fuck. Like not having the original singer there is kind of a hard reunion to do. But they were really awesome. They were really, really fun. You know, which really is what good. I heard and why I was like, what? I, I still don't know why. You know what it was? I was like, I had the experience of hanging out with the band. Jimmy Zero literally sat with me and his girlfriend, and just hung out with me and just talked to me for like I must have been there for forty five minutes just hanging out. He just was talking to some kid he didn't know. Yeah. I, I couldn't get over it, and it was like I think he was so enamored that somebody recognized him. Yeah. That he was just like, hey, I'm going to do, because he, he was like, you know what we used to do? We used to call up James Williamson and he would sit and talk to us. And we would, we'd oh, all gather around cool. the phone and talk to James yeah. Williamson and that's he would cool. give us the time of day. And, uh, cool. and I was like, you know what? I've had my experience. I'm going to go see Ted Leo for the second time or the third time. Yeah, and I was just yeah, like, yeah. why did I do that? Why did I do it, Eric? I got a stiff story for you. I was, I, yeah. I, believe, I believe it was, it was a Lords in the New Church show in Cleveland. Oh, cool. And and I was so he played this place, a fantasy theater, which is like an old movie theater that punk shows at. And when you when we when we parked, we came over and you walk past this this little street. There's an alley that's basically behind the whole theater. And then yeah. you go around the corner and you go in the front and you walk in the theater. So we're walking and I see down the alley, I see this skinny little character taking a piss, you know, just standing there pissing. And the hair, because you know, Lords of New Church had that huge hair. And this guy's pissing, and I look close. I'm like, that's Stiv Bears. I'm like, hey, Stiv, man, how's it going? And he did one of these. He switched the penis, waved like this. <laughs> hey, man. And he went back to pissing. It was hilarious. I'm like, that is perfect. I'm not going to wait for him to finish and talk to him. I'm not going to try to go over there and talk to him. I'm just going to let him have his pee. That was perfect. And that was when I sort of met Stiv Bader's, you know. And he speaking, was dead, dead five years later. Speaking of the, uh, speaking of the Pixies. That you never see them outside. You never, oh, ever, okay. ever see. Never. Not at. Not at this state. Maybe. Maybe. You know. Back when they're doing the Sex and Death Doolittle tour. Or well, whatever. Frank Black is a pretty pasty guy. You know, he probably can't be. Yeah, a he's not. Th these are not people. People like they are not. <laughs> there. But I saw a guy making out with a brick wall. I'm gonna condense the story. Super condense the story. So right. I see a guy making out with a brick wall, and he's wearing a cabbie hat, bald, and he's smoking a cigarette. And he's literally facing the wall like a weirdo. Total weirdo. And I go, oh, my God, that's Joey Santiago. For, for me, that's one of my guitar heroes. That's my yeah, James yeah. Williamson, one yeah, of them, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And my, um, I, I squeeze my buddy Rich's arm. I don't say a word. I just squeeze his arm, like, really tight. Like, I heard him. And he turns to me, like, what is your problem? And he sees what I see. And I, my eyes are like this. And I go 
to talk to him to, and I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm like a moth drawn to light. Cause you're just right. like, you're, you're speechless right. and you forget that you're speechless and you forget that. Like, and then as I'm turning, it was like, I see his eyes and his eyes are like, please don't talk to me. Oh, please yeah, don't yeah. talk to me. I'm yeah. smoking a cigarette. It's super right. cold. Like, please, I just need, I'm about to go on stage in 30 yeah. minutes. Just like, let me yeah. do my thing. Yeah. And I'm, it's like full breaks. Yeah. But at the same time, he sees that I see him. I see him too. I don't want to look like a weirdo and turn away. Cause I'm like, and I just walk up and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, thank you for <laughs> good show. And then I like stop myself because I realized the show hasn't even happened yet. I'm thanking him for a show that hasn't happened yet. And I go, I'm looking forward to a good show. And he just kind of like, goes, he's like, thanks. Thanks. And just turns back around. And I just like, you know, you play that moment over and over again in your head going like, how could I have done that differently? Well, my problem okay. is I, I tend to, I tend to go up and say some dumb shit thing and I don't even care, but I, this is a good one today. I'll make a transition here for you. It is mm. Bob, Bob Mould's birthday today from Who's and Sugar and all that. Mazel Tov. Congratulations. Bob, Bob Mould's birthday. He's got a new record coming out. And I saw Who's and I don't remember what year this, but this was probably, this is the first of two times I saw them. So this was probably 86. And it was the same place where I was saying I saw Lords of the New Church. So it was a fantasy theater and upstairs and over is a little bar called the Fantasy Nightclub. And I was still just starting to see shows. So I didn't yeah. exactly know how it worked. And I found myself, I just went to the bar afterwards and I didn't realize that sometimes the fantasy theater used the little bar as like their backstage kind of for the bands. But I don't remember ever seeing bands there too much anyway. Would have, anyway, I mean like backstage wise, but I walked to a backstage part of the bar that I didn't even know existed. The door was just open. And I looked in and I saw Bob Mould in the corner, just standing Whoa. there. Yeah. But, th but there was about five just gawking, you know, kids standing around him. And yeah. all, they were, all they were doing was like, just like this, standing and staring. Yeah. And so I walked up and I went, excuse me. I said, hey, Bob, I just want to say thanks. It was a really great show. And he kind of went like, Oh, thank you. You know, because it was like so weird for him to just have these people literally, they weren't even like asking for autographs. They were just kind of standing you. there gawking. Yeah, and I just you. felt like he's a human. He's not, yeah. gonna, what's the worst that could happen? Maybe he just says, get the fuck yeah. out of here. But, and then I chatted with him for a second. You know, he was very nice, but it was just like, he kind of like, oh, you know. Yeah, was, but that's the fear. That is so the fear. That's the fear of, I'm about to meet someone whose guitar playing i worship or whoever a singer songwriter whatever that i worship and i'm so afraid that the experience is going to be poor because like in joey santiago's instance he was yeah. not in the mood to talk to people and I, yeah. I i read that and i was like dude turn like turn turn around it's like the fear of like meeting those people and then being like i'm glad that your that your your, your experience with bob was so great that's like I that's like the general, best the best scenario you know in general it's just for budding budding fan fan kids out there in general, the after show, if you happen to see the person hanging out in the back back parking lot or whatever, after is probably better because you're yeah. kind of coming down, mm -hmm. you're tired, you just had a bunch you're of people yeah. for you, and you mm -hmm. sort of probably hopefully feel, if not good, at least you feel like just, okay, the show's over. You're more ready to kind of wind down. And, you know, people want to say- hey, Serotonin's up or whatever. Yeah, but before yeah. the show's always kind of awkward because you're running around, you're making set lists, you're trying right. to get, what's, why is there no beer in the backstage? You're doing all that shit that you do before mm -hmm. a show. And it's kind of, a, you know, it can be a little weird sometimes. I mean, I usually, I like talking to fans. Or do you make you make the set lists when you guys play? Who yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we usually, we'll, we'll agree on like a basic one before the tour. And then we, each night I write it all out and maybe move a few songs around and pull another song out and put it in and you know that's um, great and then show it to those guys and then inevitably we kind of give the drummer the the last say because he you know recognizes his similar beats in two songs in a row or something he doesn't want to do or the same speed or whatever so you, you try to mix it up you know so i mean what's amazing about you guys too and it's like i even remember back in 2014 when i saw you guys play it's just that like for a guy for a bunch of guys that get together every once in a while it's like the, it feels like the muscle memory is really still there the chemistry between you guys is like is still yeah. there and that like you just sort of man you click in and, and it's just you know off to the races you know yeah i think the kind of music too you know like sam's such a great drummer and we all we yeah we've all just played with each other for so long that mm. yeah we, we know the songs and even if we do pull out one we haven't done in a long time we usually try to go through it at sound check if we can and you know and, and try to do it and then, like i said if it fucks up it fucks up but but yeah it's definitely a muscle memory <laughs> wait so did you used to see you used to see the mummies like all the time oh i never no that's the funny thing is i never 
I never saw the mummies because we living in Columbus, on the West Coast. Yeah, Columbus. Yeah. Columbus was a really good town in the '90s. For it was actually got better than Cleveland, I think, as far as bands coming through town because it's a huge university. You got a lot of kids there. You got some good gateway fun centers there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, the what? I so I drove out to Columbus, oh, Ohio. The film stuff. Yeah, that, yeah. That, was, that kind of happened after I moved. But, oh, okay. Uh, I I had never been. I drove out to Columbus for this film festival called the Nightmares Film Festival. Oh and, yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. Um, yeah, and uh, my my film played there, and uh, I Crazy. just yeah, I loved I loved the the town. It was it was yeah. it was wonderful to be there, and um, the Gateway Film Center was really cool. And I just it, it you know what's you know what Columbus is? Columbus is like the Chicago between Chicago and New York in a weird kind of way. <laughs> it's know? funny you say that because I always say that, you know, I always feel like a lot, a lot of times Chicago, you know, the second, second city nickname. And like, I always feel yeah. like sometimes people have a little chip on their shoulder about New York. I feel like Columbus is like that with Cleveland. They're kind of the second. Oh, really? City really? Of Ohio. <laughs> but, um, and boy, can you imagine being second city to Cleveland? But, um, ah. anyway, and I love Cleveland. I love Cleveland a lot, but, um, no, Columbus is great. And it was really good at the time because it, it was like, Bands really did come through more and more. And it became a couple of little indie labels started and a couple of our bands kind of started touring a little bit. So it got to be known better as a, you know, after the, like into the nineties as a place. It was a rooting stop. Yeah, routing we, stop. yeah. And we really yeah. got to see a ton of bands, but the West coast bands, like if they're going to come all the way to Ohio, they're probably going to play Cincinnati because it's more South and they're kind of on their way South, or they're going to play Cleveland because it's kind of a bigger radio market or whatever. And it's near Detroit and up on the way to New York and stuff. So like you that. had to go out of your way if you're going to go see yeah, something. I mean, the mummies, yeah. as far as I knew, never, as far as I know, I don't think they ever even played anywhere in Ohio or even like Michigan or something. But I right. have since seen them like, I don't know, four four times or something. And these reunion things ever since they started in, I think it was 2009 or 10 when they first did kind of a short reunion tour sort of. I saw them in New York and I saw them at the, I saw them at the opening of the third man uh, pressing plant record store in, in Detroit. I saw them huh. there. They played with uh, the Oblivions a couple of years ago. Whoa, like that's another one on my list that I just want to like yeah, see great. really bad. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. The the I remember discover going back to when I discovered the I discovered the mummies. I'm like, oh my god, when are these guys are these guys still around? I got to go catch them play. Oh, the mummies the mummies are are are, are broken up. But then oh, they are the reuniting for the first time, and they're playing in Spain. Screw you. Oh, <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm like, damn, I'm like, damn, <laughs> like, you're, if you're reuniting. But <laughs> if there's a connective tissue in all the bands in my book, maybe not all of them, because they didn't all get to Europe, but inevitably you just always find out that like at some point earlier in your career, uh, somebody invites you, you get onto some sort of European festival and you're just like, we're going to do this anytime they ask. Cause you're just treated mm -hmm. better. You're paid better. Oh yeah. Hospitality is nice over there. It's just, I had never been to Europe and my, I, I'm not sure I would have ever got to Europe. If it wasn't for the band. Like my family didn't yeah. have much money. I, the first time I was ever on a jet was because the Turks were going to Europe. That you guys played all, you guys played I mean, all over. Yeah. I mean, our very first tour in Europe was, I believe it was 56 shows in 68. Wow. And we, we went to New York and we played and then we took a plane from New York to Amsterdam, I think. Is yeah. Where we or yeah, I think we landed in Amsterdam. And that was the first time I was ever on a jet. It was like a six hour wow. flight. You know? So, um, but yeah, that tour was great. But after that one, that was almost 10 weeks. And we were like, eh, we, the kind of music we do and the energy and everything, like we got to split it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, the we, wear and tear. Yeah, we right? could never be one of those bands that does like five months in a row. You know, it's like, I just, I can't yeah. even imagine. You know? You're not going to creepy crawl like Black Flag. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, right. I saw Black Flag too. I saw the, I believe it was the third last Black Flag show. And I read in wow. that book. Did you ever read that book? Our band can be your life. Our band could be your life. Uh, heard that book has also been it's on great. my radar. I've read. Okay, I've read. We inherited the neutron bomb. We got the neutron bomb. Yeah, we great. got the neutron bomb. Please kill me. Yeah. And there's from the velvets to the voidoids, I think. Yeah, and then heebie-jeebies at the CBGBs. Yeah, those are good. Yeah, I gotta finish that heebie-jeebies book. But um, I saw a, a panel roundtable discussion about that book with handsome Dick Manitoba, and it was fucking hilarious but anyway um and it was at a jewish center in in midtown it was like this very <laughs> scholastic like oh harvey Picar was on that that panel too he's but a anyway, character uh, handsome uh, dick yeah, is a character yeah, but, i saw him sing for the mc5 that was a trip oh i saw that too that was great that was but, a trip. um yeah anyway it, no what was i just saying oh um about, about going to europe you were going to europe going and, europe and, and wear and tear uh, wear and tear yeah, I guess that basically. I forgot my line of thought. Doesn't matter. All right, but, but yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, handsome. You saw that MC five. You saw that MC five. Uh, I saw BKT. the first one that 
they called yeah mc dkt yeah, mc5 two years ago they did the 50th anniversary one or whatever i didn't even bother man because i was like where's 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 dennis if you don't was, have dennis i'm not going it was kind of cool because they did it um the band that they had with them was good and i and it was cool but i like that first tour too because they had those like Marshall Crenshaw came out and did a song. I was like, what? All dude right. from uh, Mon- Mud Honey Dude did yeah, some songs. Yeah. Sun Ra opened. Oh, I wow. saw them with Sun Ra. Okay, this was Central Park. It was free. It was 2005. And it was, yeah, it was the, it was DKT MC5. And it was before, uh, you know, Michael Smith. Was, Michael Smith is the, my, uh, Michael Davis, the bass oh, yeah. player, still alive. And, um, and they, man, the, it was, it was awesome. And, you know, yeah. And handsome Dick is, ha- uh, is handsome Dick. And, um, and it was a great, it was a great show. It was just a really, really phenomenal, um, experience. And I'm glad I, I had I it. I don't know. I, if I, if I remember correctly, I think I was out of town when that show happened. I think we might've had some out of town shows. And I remember when Radio Birdman reformed and we played with them in Cleveland and they were great, but they nice. had the whole original band and, yeah, so I mean, we played with the Stooges at a festival in Tromso, Norway. Uh, okay, right what was Garden. that? Did you meet? Did you meet him backstage? Did you meet any of them backstage? Yeah, yeah no? it's a story I've told so many times. I don't even really want to tell you. All right, all right, come uh, on, give me the cliff notes. Give me the cliff notes. Essentially, yes, we we played. It's embarrassing and silly, and it, and it was you know, but we no, but we played with them, and they were just. I mean. It's just amazing to think you get to see, you know, one of your top three bands or whatever, you know, and this makes up an, for the dead boys, <laughs> well, such an important man and such a like something you just never thought you'd see. And it, surely, like when you think that the Ramones were all dead and these guys are still alive, you know what I mean? Like, it was just like amazing. You think I'd ever see them. So I was expecting, I figured it could be nuts because Iggy's always nuts, but it was just really great. No, we just went backstage. I, I yeah, and we just hung out and met them, and, and it was goofy. Uh, you can you can interview one of our other bandmates, and they can have fun telling you that how I put my foot in my mouth or whatever. But <laughs> uh, my, my more favorite story is when I was seventeen. You yeah. know, it was a great story. It was a great story. We talked to them all. I finally met Ron Ashton. That was amazing. It was all great. But when I was seventeen, Iggy was coming through town. I think on the blah 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 tour. That album, not a very good album. That great. that was the Real Wild Child yes, yes. Uh, album. Yes. The the yes. new wave Iggy. Yeah, very overproduced, very eighties. Real but, Wild um, World. A couple good songs. Yeah, but was, that show was great. He was great, and I ran up. He came out during No Fun, and he went into the audience. And I ran up and there was a, a body, bunch of bodyguards around him like this, pushing people away. And I got on the ground and I snuck through their legs and yes. popped up right in front of Iggy. Yes. Like this close. Yeah. And he, and I grabbed the mic from him like that. And he just, and I started screaming the lyrics or whatever I was screaming. Yes. And he just pointed at me like this while I was doing it and giving me the yes. thumbs up. And I just sort of yes. knew, right? I mean, I know that sounds corny, but I, I, I hadn't been in a band yet or anything, but I was just like, this is fun, you know? And it was Did just you tell like, him about that when you saw him years later? Did no, you bring I, that up? No, I did not. <laughs> didn't get, let's just say I didn't get a chance. Um, you know, so I saw. I've met, I've met him a couple times since, and I met him at a a gallery art gallery show in Detroit one time, like 2003, and he was there holding his little Chihuahua the whole time. Yeah, he's top. that's that's Jim. That's not Iggy. Talk yeah, about yeah. the talk about the switch. That's that's Jim Osterberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he then was very he, nice. yeah. he was there with his beautiful girlfriend. Oh, are you? Yeah, he was very nice. And, Nina. Uh, it was a rock. It was a. It was like a rock artist gallery show, and it was all like rock people who do art. And there was some Ron Ashton yeah. pieces that were pretty good, and Iggy had some stuff. And then Niagara was there, and she had some cool paintings, obviously. And that was a really good time. And I, yeah, I talked to him a little bit then, and I, I think I met him one other time or something. But anyway, did you see the? Did you see him on that last uh, that po- post pop depression tour? Yeah, it was great. It was awesome. So not that yeah. is to me, that is the the rightful continuation to the Bowie albums like that is the perfect trifecta yeah 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 that, i mean i listen I, i'll talk about deep cuts i'll go some deep cuts on iggy iggy songs and whatever but for me that set list was, oh, it was immaculate it was and immaculate he sounded great and he the thing oh about, there, so i'm at the capital you, yeah you talk about being possessed and stuff like this isn't just a guy in his 40s or 50s i mean this, he's old at this point. he and stage like, dived he, he friggin played, stage dived dude and what you see like when we played with him and this is now in like 2000 when we played with him in trom so it was what 2000 like six maybe and he he was just about to turn 60 or he was 59 oh, no, or something. and he was he was uh, crazy on stage and then when we saw him walk down the stairs because we got backstage towards the end of their set and you know mm-hmm. when we saw him walking down steps i mean you could just tell he's like 
he's so he's just beat himself up for years and how somehow how he does that on stage i just have no fucking idea there's a story in columbus there was a a festival that came through i'm going to say this is probably like 98 and it was this is super goofy i kind of want to do some research on this it was a you know what you know the mid 90s all those bad i think you're going to tell me the same story that i was going to okay go ahead tell me your story you know they had all those ridiculous like Lollapalooza, like right festivals in the 90s mm-hmm. and most of them lasted for one or two summers and they fell apart and there were some big ones or whatever well skull that's right skull the chewing tobacco company <laughs> did did a, <laughs> did a festival one year i don't even know it was what it was called but i wasn't gonna go because it was it was a pretty bad lineup it was like it was like ozzy and iggy were like the big headliners and yeah. then it was like maybe like social distortion and then it was like a bunch of like you know, space hog or something. It just wasn't very good. It was like, yeah, whatever. And um, so I didn't want to go. And it was like a hundred dollars or something. But a friend of mine went and not a friend anymore, actually. I shouldn't say friend. Anyway, and he um he saw the show and he was supposed to review it for this local paper. So Iggy comes out and on the second song, which I think was no fun, the second song, he decides to jump in the audience. And there are folding chairs because it's an outdoor <laughs> amphitheater. There's folding chairs. Yeah. Nobody tries to catch him and he lands on a fucking folding chair. And his arm dislocates. He walks around to the stairs. He gets back on the stage and he's trying to sing the show with his arm like dangling from his body. And mind you, in 98, Iggy would have been what? My math is bad. He's 47. No, he was born in 47. So he was probably about 50. About 50 years old. And his arm's dangling. And he was cut, of course, like he cut his forehead or something. Of course he did. And he wanted to keep doing the show. And he was doing this, like, you know, like, because he's bleeding. you know. And he wanted to try to keep doing the show. And they, and my friend said, everybody was bummed out because he was the headliner. And the rest of the lineup was like, eh. And here, the second song, the bouncers literally dragged him off the stage and said, no, dude, you have to get in a fucking ambulance, you know? So my friend said he went out to the car. And he saw the ambulance when he got out on the highway. So he followed it. And he said he could see Iggy sitting up in the gurney, like complaining and yelling. And he said he was probably yelling that he wanted to go finish the show. You know? There's okay. There's a story. And this is, th- this also requires some investigation. I've heard the story uh, of a few times. Um, there's a story of Iggy. It's a very short story. It's literally Iggy is climbing the, the scaffolding. This is somewhere in Greece. It's funny. I've tried to find it on YouTube because there's so many great Iggy shows from the 90s. Yeah. Because like you said, he was doing the the festival circuit as Iggy Pop. He had Pete Marshall. Pete Marshall was in his band from Damien from Sam Hain was in his band. Uh, They were Iggy and the Trolls. And and yeah, and they were they were just constantly touring, you know, all over the world doing these these things. You know, uh, Lust for Life was back in action because of train spotting and stuff. You know, he, he was having a little bit of resurgence. He's climbing the scaffolding in Greece and somebody chucks a bottle hits him in the head bottle explodes he starts he's bleeding from the head and like king kong hanging off the scaffolding he screams into his microphone you can't kill me i'm iggy pop (laughs) (laughs) and like is it true i don't know but god damn it do i want it to be true because it's such a good because it's so is it not the personification of this guy you know he put out he puts out some weird albums and he put out an album in 2009 called it's some french title polymier or something yeah, 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 uh yeah. soft spoken and it's a it's actually got some pretty beautiful songs but one of them is called king of the dogs and i thought what an interesting book because at the time you're thinking well how far is this guy's career really going to stretch at this point yeah. you know <laughs> you know he's still he's he's you know mid stooges reunions and he's putting out this album as iggy pop um and he, his song is called king of the dogs i'm just thinking he went from I want to be your dog in 1969 <laughs> yeah. to becoming king of the dogs in 2009. He outlived them all. Yeah. He outlived everybody. He outlived the Ramones. He outlived, you know, just everybody died. And he, yeah. he outlived Stiv and Johnny Thunders. And and all time, They're all dead. Every time we say this about him or Keith Richards or anybody during this year, we always go knock on wood because this fucking year has been so. Funny. Oh, my God. Oh. That you know, like any year that little Richard passes away is a terrible, terrible. Who was truly the first? You know, I had a revel- revelation about him. It's not a revelation. I mean, I, I'm sure everybody knew this, but he just was always for me. I always had a revered respect, like a lot of people. Like I'm not a big Bob Dylan fan at all. I'm just not into Bob Dylan. 
I have great respect for Bob Dylan and his place in music and what he did and yada, yada, yada. His just music is not my, it's right. not my yums. It's more of a yuck, but, Fair and not. you know, for little Richard, I always, you know, you know, Lucille, you know, uh, all, all those songs, you know, I, I know them. They're great, but like, it's, I've never done any deep dive on little Richard, oh, but little him. Richard, dude, he's the first punk man. Yeah, he's yeah. like the first, this is a guy who's writing. This guy is writing about anal sex with another man. Right. And well, people and the, are singing the, it on the radio. The story, yeah, and the stories, yeah, the lyrics he got away with, and the stories of the shows that he did in juke joints early on and stuff. Yeah, and he was pretty, you know, made fun of and sort of, you know, a little could get a little violent sometimes, you know, you know, gay, you know, black, and rock and roll, dude. Like who he is the first, he's the first punk, dude. He's I got the first to see one him at at BB King's House of Blues in Times Square. Back wow, in, I guess this is probably. I, you know, whatever, 10 years ago or something. How was and it? I think it was the last time he played here. Well, you know, it was exactly what I thought it would be, which is right. they brought him out. He was pretty old already. And and they brought him out in a wheelchair, but they made it up like a giant gold, like King's like throne. <laughs> really funny. They roll him out. They put him up to the piano. Mind you, you know, the band does the sort of intro before the person comes out mm -hmm. and they were doing it and doing it. And doing it, and it was like twenty minutes of this band doing this. Right, yeah. And finally, they roll roll little Richard out, and he's fucking hilarious. He would go into a song, and you could tell he could still play a little, and he still did a couple woos, you know. But he would just stop and be like, "You people are beautiful. You shut up, band. You people are so beautiful. <laughs> shut up." And it was just so funny. And then like these these people would come up with like dozens of roses to give to him. He would just kind of talk to him for a little bit, put the roses on the piano, and then he would jump back into a song and do like one verse and a chorus, and then just, right berating people in the audience who were getting up to piss or whatever i mean it was just really really funny but it was only about he probably did like 35 minutes maybe and then you know good night da, 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 you know <laughs> and they're rolling yeah, but i mean out. and at that age he just doesn't care at that age now, he's just like he don't, what does he care he's just like i'm just gonna do this time, man i was like i've got to meet little richard if i don't meet him tonight Did you meet him fuck no they they rolled him they had one of those giant like senior citizen bus like you know they i think they rolled him right out the ramp and into that yeah because we went outside and some friends were there and they're like yeah man he they rolled him in quick and just pulled plowed him out of here you know so you know what that's like i so i saw so i guess you were in new york around this time i didn't realize you were in new york for as long I as you've been in new york before yeah yeah. Okay, so did you were you at Little Stevens Underground Garage Rock Festival? No, but that was literally I think that was the year before I moved here. That was 2004. Was it for? Well, yep. you know, it might have been summer of 2004. It was summer of 2004. August. I moved here September of 2004. So I just missed So it. so that was I, I was 18 and that was the New, the New York Dolls had just reformed. Arthur Kane had died. So it was the Dolls without Arthur Kane. Uh the Strokes played and Iggy oh, Iggy Iggy and the Stooges were headlining. And Bo Diddley played. And, you know, I had not, I was not familiar with Bo Diddley's music, really. I knew who he was. I was, re again, respected who he was. But, you know, I, I really made sure I was like, take this in because this guy is not going to be around forever. Right. And yeah, you are yeah, seeing, yeah. you are seeing like a legend. Yeah. You know, I talked about this. We, I had, I had, um, who also played uh, Andy Chernoff and the Dictators. They played. Yeah. Only yeah. time I got to see them. And they did, man, they played four songs, but they talk about, talk about, coming in scorching everybody's face off and walking off stage leaving them wanting more that's I remember exactly what they one did of our, one of our favorite shows was when bowery ballroom opened in 2000 or was it yeah. 90, 98 2000 i think right i think 2000. um the ballroom I, that i don't know that I don't uh, know. bowery ballroom anyway whatever year it opened um one of the great first, venue though i like yeah, that place. right and one of the one of the first um shows they had was the dictators did supposedly the first reunion of the original guys in something oh like d that was D uh dictators forever forever dictators that was the Thanks. yeah when they yeah 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 and you know it was the first time they played in eight years or something like right that. right right and we got on the opening slot which was awesome it was just like one of the oh you opened for the dictators yeah yeah and it was nice packed and it was great and they were amazing and we got great stories the one i always tell is um uh ross the boss was telling me how when when man of war that, oh phew, to say the least when man of war was making their record when he had that band man of war and yeah 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 and the last paying gig that oh that orson wells ever had was an he recorded an introduction for a man of war record get really the hell out of good, here yeah really dumb pretentious you know metal record opening and they said the studio they used somewhere in brooklyn i think they had to orson was so big that they had to use the freight elevator to get him up 
to the studio that he couldn't use the regular elevator. What a story. Yeah, and they said that he was hilarious and he told he was telling stories about going down on Rita Hayworth. Hilarious. But anyway, wow. so it was this amazing night. We opened up with the dictators. I can't even believe I'm seeing the dictators because I never got to see them. Yeah. They were great. I thought we played well. It was just a great night. But it was the one and only time for all the times we played in New York and all the shit you hear about playing in New York and everything. It was the one time we got robbed. Our van got broken into. Oh. And uh, luckily it was when we were playing. So we didn't lose equipment and all that shit. But we had some personal effects. And I bought a bunch of records at a record store that day. And, you know, it was like it stole all that shit. So we spent the end of the night, like, calling up credit card companies. And, like, oh. you know, like, you know we could have been just partying. But, but, over, but overall, I mean, it was just a great. Fun. That happens more often than not. A guy who I was on that tour with when I toured with that band, he was in. he, he had been ripped off they had gotten their gear stolen twice it, both times on tour they had their whole trailer unhitched everything merch twenty thousand dollars with stuff i mean knock on wood we've been, we've been really really fortunate through the years because we always it's pretty amazing always, that happened while you were playing that's yeah, yeah we always tried to like we always tried to um make sure no matter how drunk or tired or whatever we always tried to at least bring the guitars in and maybe the snare, yeah. you know, at least try to bring some of the shit in at the end of the night. So in case we do get broken into, you know, we lose every fucking thing, you know? So we always try to at least, you know, some people, they come to New York and it's like, Oh, we parked on this small side street. But and like <laughs> we forgot to lock the doors and we left all our amps in overnight. It's like, well, you know, you kind of asked for that, you know, especially like in the late eighties or nineties too. It's like, you, come on you know you don't just any town i don't care where you play like you can't just leave everything i mean you gotta at least lock the fucker and put stuff or people who like when they get the band van and Sleep they put the van. crazy shit all over it of course you know it's a band van then right you know so we used to like rent minivans because they looked like dude mom was driving us around and it we, worked nobody ever you know we we would laugh when we were on the road we would laugh because every once in a while we'd see another band passing by and the funny thing was is like you know a band that has a giant decal of the band it's like hey free gear right here ready to be stolen like it's just such it's an advertisement yeah like what are you thinking you know yeah um but going back to the mummies for a minute you so you were they obsessed. played no 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 because i wanted to just say that yeah. we, we were talking about their seven inches they they played new york on before one of these shows to spain and in the crowd was that was, at um was was that at Southpaw over in Brooklyn that one? It was or? in okay. It was October of 2016. Oh, so that was I think Music Hall Williamsburg maybe. I don't you know I want to say it was the King's Theater and that's not true. I'm no. conflating that. No, it's not. Was not the King's Theater. Well, anyway, was, go ahead. Sorry. I, whatever. I went down because I was like, and they literally it was a second show because the first show had sold out. They did a second. They put a second show on I at the last that. minute, and I I scrambled to get to that last that second show. I went to the first of those two shows. I oh, you okay? So you were there as well. Yeah. Um. The, uh. In the audience was Iggy Pop's bass player from the post pop depression tour, the the bald guy with the mustache. I was like, oh, Matt, Matt Matt Sweeney. You know I, him. I, yeah, I know him really well from years ago. We we used to hang out with him when we first got Wait, come what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so funny, dude. Yeah. So I recognize him. I didn't know who his name I didn't know his name, but I had seen him play with Iggy at the Capitol yeah, Theater. Exactly. And him and I, we were just shoot, we were just shooting the shit in the crowd before the mummies went on. I was like, dude, it was just so cool that he was a mummies fan. I was like, yeah, yeah, dude, yeah. you were so great with Iggy and blah 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 and yada yada oh, yada. And he knows all that shit. He knows so much about yeah. it. Yeah, cool guy, really yeah, guy. freaking yeah. cool guy. Great guy, very fucking funny. Um, yeah, he's he's great. Yeah. Now, the one time I saw, oh, I saw you twice. One time was King Kong and the King Kong and the Barbecue Show played. I want to say this was last year sometime at a tiny little spot. That what's that guy, Jonathan, the DJ guy? Jonathan Tubin. Jonathan Maybe it Tubin, was him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably. I'm sure it was. Yeah, he, yeah, he like, puts on he puts on those little shows, and they came through, and 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 uh, like Don Pedro or something, or, or Don Pedro and Mark yeah. was was livid because his his guitar. I felt so bad for him. Honestly, I felt frustrated for him because he was like, you know, his guitar. He just wanted to play the, the he just wanted to play the show, and like the yeah. guitar was not working, and yeah. it was just getting. Uh, and it was it was still a very fun show, even though there were a lot of technical snafus. I saw you there. I saw. I think Howie Pyro was there as well. And um, I'm really glad I went to the show. I almost didn't go to the show, but I'm glad I went to the show because I don't know the next oh, time I get to see King Kong of the Barbecue show. No, do you, you know mean the one down in um, – they played down in – It was Don Pedro. I think it's called Don Pedro's. Whatever it was. Lower East Side or Brooklyn? 
Yes, it was Lower East Side. It was not. It's a different club. I'm forgetting. The, I can't believe I'm not remembering the name. It's a uh, hole in the wall, tiny it's little where, joint. I can't believe I'm not remembering. That. It's where Tubin DJed all the time. Yes, it's it was. It, but that's what I'm saying. It was one of those DJ, and there was, was a like weird guy. Basement bar. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And there was, was a there, weird yeah. guy who went. Yeah. And there was a weird guy. I didn't. I. I recognize you. I didn't say anything to you because I had nothing I to think, say. But I just Mark, Mark, and and, and <laughs> Con. They. I think part of their whole thing is they almost. I don't say they like to get into that, but it's like it kind of fuels them both up when they finally kick in and it finally works. Oh, it's they're so great. And they're great, right? And they and they oh my God. I actually so I think I took off of that show because I hung out with Khan. He had played the night before at a he's an interesting before. cat. That guy yeah, yeah. fascinates me. Yeah. Fascinates so we hung out and it was really nice catching up with them and everything. And yeah, I felt bad for Mark too because that was beyond the usual. Mark's kind of pissed off at something. It was like clearly shit was not working. No, no, no. He, he had a tech no, yeah. he had a no, yeah, yeah, he had yeah. a straight up he there were moments before going on, he had a straight up technical snafu. Yeah. And he was fr he was just he was just frustrated oh, was because annoying. people were like, come on, play. And he's like, yeah. dude, my guitar's not working. You know, it's like yeah, there's a difference between like and you're talking about budget rock. Yes, it's true, yeah. you know. If one <laughs> string breaks or your amp is cracking a little or something, just deal with it. You're a crappy son. You, you, you deal with lo-fi anyway, but that's easier said than done. And if you're actually playing, it's annoying, right? You know, if you can't, if you yeah. can't even hear yourself or whatever. And yeah, he was definitely, there were some real fucking problems there. Remember that was like 45 minutes of them, like trying to figure it they out. They were trying right? to figure it out, but then they kicked in, they played yeah, the right. best show that they could. And they did, uh, man, I got it. I've seen them twice. I saw them also at, the Bowery Ballroom, actually, yeah. I think they played. Yeah. And um they're just I love them. They're great. Um, did you wait? So did you used to see like the space shits and stuff back in the day? He played with the space shits real early on. When we first played up hmm. in Toronto, they opened up for us, and that's where we met those guys. And then I remember that's also a great band, too. Oh, that's where totally yeah, that's where they started, right? Yeah, they were awesome when they were teenagers and just like super wiry on stage and crazy. And then hmm. maybe I don't remember exactly, but I know we played with them again, and then I remember I hadn't seen any of those guys in a long time. And then around like 2000 and like one or something, uh, it said Mark's or barbecue BBQ playing at this local bar in Columbus. I'm like, Oh, what's that? And then I vaguely heard that maybe he was in the spaceships or something. So I went and it was just when he started calling himself that, and it was just him doing the one man band. He didn't call it Mark Sultan. He was calling it. Uh, yeah. Right. Barbecue. And, then, right. and I was like, Oh, holy shit, man. I haven't seen you in years, you know? And then that kind of got back in touch with those. Cause guys. then they fused, right. Isn't that what happened? And they were like, yeah. let's do the King Kong. Yeah, Con had, Con had a King Kong. He called it King Kong and he was doing that in Europe. He was also doing the, sh was the shrines came later. Yeah, or that shrines. Was... No, it was the shrines and then barbecue. He might've just called it the King Kong show or King Kong or something. And then he called it King Kong and the shrines and then barbecue, whatever. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the spaceships were, yeah, a lot of fucking fun. When we played mm. with them. It was so weird because Mark, well, I always describe it as like, Mark looked like a, a guy who happened to saunter into the bar looking for something to do and like just got out of hardcore practice next door because the hoodie yeah. and he's all fucking angry looking and like this. And then he gets up on stage and does this super trashy like Sonics, like what? Like it was just, and they, they were great. Yeah, they were really great. Great band. Um, he has some voice too. that, that oh song, God, I'll be so loving ridiculous. you. They yeah. both have great voices, but they, yeah. I don't know what it is about what they do. It just, it just blows me. Away. I like the, that invisible, uh, what's it called? Um, the middle record, uh, invisible. Yeah, no, there's four records there. Uh, the, the, the second to last one, I think it is, uh, invisible girl mm -hmm. is top to bottom. Yeah. And they're kind of tongue in cheek too. The way that like with songs like anal, anal, <laughs> like, that's one way to put it. Taste buds. Or just pissing. yeah, they're tongue in cheek, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're tongue in cheek. It's pretty great. So the thesis of this whole show is the idea that I guess maybe pizza is a punk food, or really just the juxtaposition of pizza and punk. Pizza is punk. I gotta get what's his face. I want Drew Kramer from Personal and the Pizzas on this <laughs> show because I feel like he's like got the, the he monopolizes pizza punk. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, but what is like in your, in your writer sort of way, in your prism, if you agree with my thesis, how is, how is pizza punk? Why, why, how well, and why? Well, from a very early age, I, I'll try to make this a quick story, but my sister, Claire, who I'm, I'm friendly with to this day, I love my sister. Um, but you know, she's a little more of a, you know, straight kind of suburban mom. And, and, you know, I went that way and that's fine. But, um, I remember she went on a date in high school, I don't know how she ever met this guy. Uh, he was a bald leather jacketed punk rock guy. I'm like, how the hell my sister ever met this guy? Cause all her other boyfriends were, you know, pretty straight laced kind of guys. I'm trying to remember the name of the band he was in, but anyway, 
I was my fledgling. I had seen a couple of shows so far in my life. I was pretty young. But I recognized this guy from seeing him at shows. I'm like, where the fuck did my sister? Anyway, he was dropping her off for a date. And he had set down a video cassette, a VHS tape, you know. And they're talking and saying goodnight. And he left. And he happened to leave that video cassette there. And on that video cassette was, you know, on the old VHSs, you could set the time so that the tape moves slower so you could fit more hours on the cassette, yep. you know? Yep. SLP. Yep. Yeah, SLP. So there were three movies on there. Repo Man, Fabulous Stains, and Rock and Roll High School on that one tape. Wow. And yeah, yeah. And, and I had never seen any of them, right? So maybe I'd seen Rock and Roll High School. But so I watched... I watched Rock and Roll High School and just that scene where they bring the pizza backstage and everyone's so excited to eat it. And Dee, Dee just said, yeah. pizza, I want some. And I interviewed, <laughs> I interviewed Alan Arkish, the director of, of Rock and Roll High School. And wow. he said, yeah, it's online. It's on the Please Kill Me uh, website. Or no, it's on the Village Voice. Even though Village Voice isn't around, the website's still there. And my interview with Alan Arkish. I'm going to check that there. out. Okay. Please read it. It's a lot of fun. And I interviewed him about the great movie Get Crazy on Please Kill Me. Oh, online. I saw that at the Alamo, dude. That played oh, at the crazy. Alamo, I, man. I, yeah. But, All right. So go, go ahead. Go ahead. Anyway, go ahead. When, when Didi said that, Alan Arkush said it took something like 20 takes yeah. to get that line. And when you watch it, it looks like the first take, you know? And then the way that Joey is so sad because he has to eat wheat germ, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, that to me, you know, just that if pizza fuels the Ramones that much, you know, I was pretty young. I was like 13 or something. I was just like, man, if pizza fuels the Ramones that much, then it must mean something to punk. But yes, of course, on the road when you're in a band, pizza is always an option. It's usually the backstage food. Really, have you ever had a pizza that was genuinely that horrible? Not if you're really hungry, you know. So you can get away with, and pizza in its even cheap form can be fun. And so budget rock, if you will, budget pizza, if you will, could still be okay. Two bros pizza. Just want some pizza, yeah. We had one called uh, Ohio Stater Pizza, and you can imagine it's as bad as it sounds yeah. on campus. And they were like, yeah, I forget what it was, three pizzas for five bucks or something, like that kind of yeah. pizza. And we had one, Gumby's, which was a Midwest chain. That was actually pretty good. But yeah, you know, it's kind of like anybody can kind of throw together a pizza if they wanted to, which is kind of like the old, here's three chords, now play a song, you know? So here's three, here's three ingredients, sauce, yeah. bread, and... Yeah, uh, pepper, I don't know, garlic, but um, yeah. So I guess if you have to pull that out of me, that's, that's my relationship with pizza. To... I think that's beautiful. And, you know, I don't think there's a wrong answer. And that's why I keep asking <laughs> the question over and over again, is that, it's you know, it's the type of, it. yeah, you could just explore it forever, which is, you know, I just thought that would, that's a really sort of fun, interesting way to um, sort of, you know, uh, explore the theme of the show. And the last <laughs> thing I will say, because I think we got to wrap it up here. The last thing I'll say is this: um, we we the what we didn't get to this part of the conversation at the beginning, but I think it's worth mentioning that the we're talking about like where where does the the, the all the bands that you wrote about right. where does it where does that go? Because it doesn't just end. Well, where yeah, does it fun, go? Fun you should ask. So. Um, I do want to say that, um, well, first of all, I had a band, The Livids, from 2011 to 2013 in Brooklyn, and we have a singles comp that's out now on a label called Danger House Skylab. We literally got them last week, only 500 made. Congratulations. Go to Danger House Skylab. Wonderful. Tim Warren from Crip Records remastered all of our singles. I'll link it in the comments. Yes, and we threw some live songs on. There was a lot of fun to put together as a whole album, which is kind of how we always wanted it, and a lot of pictures inside and everything like that. So also, my book, We Never Learn, um, the publisher, I'm in talks with them about doing a 10th anniversary edition with some color photos and maybe a new chapter, a last nice. chapter to say exactly what you're asking. And I don't know when it's going to get done. I mean, the idea is that it comes out next spring, but who knows with COVID and when it gets done and all that, who knows, probably won't be out till next fall, but it will be out there because I'm hearing people tell me they're looking on eBay and my book's going for a hundred dollars and stuff. That's ridiculous. Just, you know, and it's still available digitally and all that too. Anyway. So, um, yeah, so the first, that was one of the first things. We're like, well, if I do an extra chapter, how do I want to do it? You know, do I want to kind of catch up with one of the bands in the book? Do I want to say, and I've, I've kind of decided, I'm still kind of figuring out what I want to write for it. But yeah, I, I want to, I guess ideally you want to show, did any of these, any of this sort of movement or sound or, or whatever in the 90s, did any of it keep percolating through newer bands into the 2000s and beyond? And without giving anything away. Of course, I think it did. I mean, um, the basic 
lo-fi sound is pretty standard with a lot of young punk and garage bands now, I think. I think saying that you're really into the Back from the Grave compilations or you're really into the Gories doesn't get you inquisitive looks anymore. You know, lots of people know these bands. And in fact, like the Gories, the Oblivions, the Mummies, Teen Generate, a lot of them did reunion shows in the 2010s where they were packing out, you know, six, seven, 800 people, you know? So obviously those records have, a lot of them have aged well and have influenced some stuff. And then there's labels like Slovenly and Goner Records is still doing stuff in the red, Burger. In the red. Which, yeah, in the red record. Yeah. Burger for whatever might've happened, right. but that was kind of an offshoot of the whole, you know, trashy rock bands, you know, and, um, you know, that the Black Lips, I think got very big and very popular. And very big. Around, yeah. You know, and the, sure, not top 10 hits, but I mean, in our world, you can't really get much bigger than, than the Black Lips. Yeah. You know? But that, but there's a new type of bit, but this is like, this is in the age of Spotify big. Like it's, it's a different, it's a completely yeah. different world. It's right. a, such right. a, right. it's a different world. And I'll tell you as a Spotify I love Spotify as a music, as a music. And I think like the truly responsible music lover who, who, who loves Spotify you, when your band, when you see that the bands come to town, you go to the, you go to the show, yeah, you buy the record, crazy. you buy the shirt, you know, yeah. if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're a cool, if you're a nice guy or whatever, or you're, yeah, if you're like, uh, my royalties aren't exactly, you know, great, but, but right. Um, but like, that's the honorable, whatever. But my point is, is that what the beauty of Spotify is that like, it opens up a whole world. Yeah. With through their algorithms, there are different and, ways you can be big now. You don't have to have a top right. ten hit to be big, you know. And right. anyway, yeah, I think that there King Kong Barbecue is another one. I think the Raining Sound kept going and got very popular in their own Great way. Band. And so I do think, considering that maybe we're seeing the slow erasing of not erasing, but the slow just um, end of guitar based rock as being a really big popular music, a la the new Rolling Stone 500 list where there's hardly any, you know, but whatever, I don't care to argue about lists like that, who cares, but it does kind of show that like, if we really are witnessing some sort of end of all that music, it's kind of amazing how many bands are still out there doing the trashy guitar thing and the, right. you know, the chords and the screaming and the, and the, that kind of thing. And again, I think any young musician can feel inspired by the way, most of the bands in my book, they did it themselves, as they say, DIY. And they also, you figure out a way to record your fucking band. I mean, frankly, it's That's easier right. than ever with laptops and your own. There's phone. no excuse today. Yeah, there's no excuse. But you can even find other wacky ways of just recording yourself and getting it done and getting it out there. You can throw it up anywhere on a, on a band camp or whatever. And, you know, and I think I think a lot of that impetus and feeling, not to be overly uh, serious about it or overly uh, uh, important about it, came from those 90s bands that really, in the face of alternative rock even getting huge and bands getting six-figure advances, these bands still kept doing their thing and recording on four tracks or a Right, they survive. Or, They're the mammals. The dinosaurs died and the mammals keep keep being yeah, mammals, we're, man. We're trilobites, really. This is starting yeah. to sound like Spinal Tap, really. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, so I don't know. In that way, I think it's it's gone on. You know, has any, once you got past the hives and the white stripes and that stuff from the early 2000s, no, there hasn't really been huge selling acts you know you know no, like taylor no. swift isn't covering the super yeah. suckers or something although she should yeah but, but you um, know what's interesting from these scenes like I, you know who comes to mind truly i saw the tijuana panthers and the garden oh yeah and i gotta yeah. tell you I, I went for the tijuana panthers and i liked the garden but i wasn't i didn't know what to expect from the garden live and the garden don't have a guitar player at all it's oh. just the two brothers it's the two twin brothers uh, uh bass and drums and I got it. If I couldn't, I, I had my ass handed to me at that show. <laughs> it was so, I was the oldest person there. Everybody's 16 years old. And, um, I, I, I couldn't believe the, the, I, I don't want to call it violence, but like the, the energy, the, the energy from these young kids getting worked up by this, what is punk rock. This is totally punk rock. And there's not a guitar to yeah. be found. They are, sort of rapping slash then jumping behind their bass and drums and doing that thing. And then they're yeah. both standing out there with pre-programmed music, yeah. um, rapping into the mic. And I'm just like, this is, this is not hip hop. This is not pop. This is punk rock. And it's punk yeah, I mean, rock it's, without guitars. It's, it's the oldest, it's the oldest kind of cliche, but it, it is kind of an attitude that you're talking about. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's an attitude of getting out there and being able to do it without a lot of extra lights or 12 people in the band or whatever and doing, you know, blasting like short loud songs or whatever you know so i suppose hopefully that'll be around for a while so. listen i want to say thank you so much this was such a pleasure for me truly to have oh, you on thanks. my yeah, show fun. thanks yeah um, thank you it was a lot of fun 
Guys, keep your keep your eyes peeled for that livid livid's reissue. I'm gonna put a link in the comments. Yeah, it's a comp uh, so, of all our singles. It's called yeah. Spoof Attacks. But anyway, Spoof, spoof attacks. attacks. So that's going to be down here. You can click, check it out, check it out. We'll have the band camp up and stuff. And, and one more quick thing. Uh, yeah. The New Bomb Turks, we found um, Jim Diamond, great Detroit producer of the latter. Well, he still produces, but he was producing a lot of those great Detroit bands in the end of the 90s and early 1000s. We did Nightmare Scenario, our last epitaph record we did with him. He found um, a dat with his original mixes, his early mixes. Because oh, right. the, yes. the album that came out ended up being kind of a mix of a few different sessions of mixes. He found his original mixes, which were super blazing and loud. And we put it on Bandcamp. You can buy it there. And all the, it's a benefit. You can read about it on our Bandcamp page. And there's a record. Um, we are hoping, we're, we're without any details, we're, we're hoping that uh, someone's going to be doing the vinyl for it, hopefully by next year. Um, cause it's really, I think it's really fun. We all of us say our favorite Turks records, a uh, destroy a boy and nightmare scenario. So we hope we can get that out. This, this raw mix one. Uh, so that'll be in the link below as well. Please check that out. It's freaking, it's a great album for sure. And, um, pizza punk pizza. And punk. That's... Keep it up. Keep slinging those pies, those <laughs> punk, punk pies. You know, I was forgetting, God, you just made me think of one other thing and I'm trying to remember what it was. And Oh my God. I don't.